Here we are in King's College. It's one of the top 25 universities in the world. And it's at the cutting edge of research. And for us at the International Observatory of Human Rights, it was the perfect venue to bring such an esteemed group of guests and to really have people who are the, recognized as the world's most prolific and renowned experts on counter-terrorism and prevention of radicalization globally. Why have we brought them together? Today, we have guests from nine nations. We bring them together for their knowledge, their expertise, and their experience. They give us all the opportunity to collectively consider how we change the dialogue. We have all seen terrorism dominating the news headlines. It threatens the fabric of our civil society. Tech-savvy extremists can reach into our communities, not only basing their drive on misinterpretations of theology, but we've seen several attacks where it's youth who's been involved, who've been misled and become easy prey to extremist recruiters. That is why IOHR has partnered with people who at one time embraced extremist ideas and only, realize the, only to realize the extent of damage they inflicted on society. They rejected the path. They dedicated their lives to prevention of de-radicalization. Committed, responsible citizens, like our friend here, Mr. Hanif Kadir, who has graciously agreed to be our chair for today's proceedings. He's inspired hundreds of thousands of people through the Not In My Name campaign. And it's his work with the ACF Foundation and with youth all the way across the world that has been making an impact which we celebrate today. It's an honor for us to co-launch our new campaign, Not Born a Radical. This is dedicated to working with young people first and becoming a bridge between them and the experts, like yourselves, like the academics and parents to address issues at the root. IOHR invited another very special man to join us today. Um, to help us better understand the mindset of terrorists. Those who not only look to take the lives of journalists, aid workers, helpers in the field, thousands of civilians in Syria and elsewhere, but have also tormented the generations to come. Mr. Theo Patnos is a US journalist and an author who brings people hope, inspiration, when he speaks with tragic optimism about his experiences. Theo is one of the few hostages who survived the merciless terror of the al Nusra Front, the former affiliate of Al-Qaeda in Syria. Theo was kidnapped in 2012. He crossed from Turkey into Syria to report on the uprising and was taken. The torture he endured at the hands of young boys, brainwashed by veteran extremists, has inspired him to ask the why and open the eyes of others. He seeks to raise awareness against the realization and of, of radicalization and extremism. His voice is to reckon with as we embrace our panel discussions and the workshop that will follow. As a fan of Viktor Frankl, the Australian neurologist, uh, sorry, Austrian neurologist, um, who survived Auschwitz, I'd like to echo the core of his concept of tragic optimism. How to say yes when you're facing death, torture, and inhumane injustice. How do you make this torture and incarceration not arbitrary? How do you make sure that we change the dialogue and change that situation? It's about turning the suffering into a human achievement that benefits all mankind. And I thank, think that is why here we've invited Theo here with us today. And we're very, very grateful for him traveling to join us. Finally, I'd ask you to think about the, comp the contributions you will hear from our esteemed panelists. Think about changing to meet the new world order um, as it continues to evolve. Every day it's a new narrative and we have to move at a pace to keep up and take over that narrative. Um, I invite you to follow our progress at Observatory IHR. We've, we're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, and we're on um, our website. You'll be able to follow up with the proceedings and follow on the papers that come from this event. Finally, I'd like you to thank me in thanking all of our
guests from all of the nine nations that they've come from around the world, and those from the UK. And I'd like to introduce Hanif Kadir, who will be your chairman for the day. Thank you, Hanif. Before I go on to chair this conference, uh, and thank you very much, uh, Valerie, uh, IOHR, Katina, for all the work and heart efforts that you put into this, to pulling this together. Um, a very bad day today, rain, disruption everywhere. Still, we've got a good, a good crowd here. I've been asked to deliver a keynote. I'm going to, I'm going to do it in five minutes. So I'm not going to go into lengthy discussions and lengthy talks about what I'm about or what happened. I think those of you who know me and those of you who don't probably um, will understand that in 2002, I traveled abroad to Afghanistan. I joined Al-Qaeda, um, not because I wanted to become a terrorist. And if you look at all the hundreds of thousands of young men and women across the world that are joining groups like ISIS, Al-Qaeda, the Nusra Front, they don't do it because they want to become terrorists. And there's a gentleman in this room today who's the first person out of my immediate family that I disclosed this to, and that's Ian Landa. Uh, this is going back, I think, 2003, 2004, when we're sitting at a coffee shop and I disclosed to him that he's asking me why, how come you, you know, you're so enthralled by it? How come you're so passionate about this work? And, you know, you're so committed. And I said, well, I have a stake in this. I have an investment in this. And that was because I was involved. I was recruited. Not because I was naive or I was vulnerable. I was recruited and I was involved because of my emotions and my frustration and my anger at the time uh, when the war on terror began. That was shortly after 9-11. Uh, and I wasn't, you know, um, one of those guys that, you know, celebrated the death of 3,000 people in, in America. I was appalled at um, people who were claiming to represent my faith, uh, who would, you know, who had put their hands up or, or were uh, blamed for, for committing that act. I was appalled at that. But I was equally appalled and I was distraught and frustrated at the way the war on terror was orchestrated. The language that was used about um, my faith, um, the crusade that started off um, because of, of 19 individuals. A whole nation was bombed back into the Stone Age. A nation that had always suffered conflict. A people that the majority of which were innocent women and children who were killed by the attacks from Allied forces. 19 people from a different nation um, were, were, were the hijackers, uh, were the terrorists that, that carried out 9-11. Yet we found that Afghanistan was the, the focal of attention. All the innocent women and children that were killed, that wasn't something that we were expecting or the, or the whole world was, um, was, was, was writing for. You know, we wanted to hit the terrorists where it hurt them. But Unfortunately, the majority of people that were caught up in the conflict were women and children. And individuals like me, and I wasn't a young kid, I was in, in my mid-30s, were frustrated at the way that indiscriminate bombings were, were taking place. Kill teams, you know, buggery units were designed and, and created by the, you know, by the United States to go out there and sexually uh, bugger young Afghan kids. Now, if anybody disagrees with me on this, you know, you're, you're free to do so. But the reality is that it, it did happen. We had individuals that were going out there deliberately creating shock and awe. So for me, it wasn't about becoming a terrorist. It was about going there and doing something that was right by my fellow human being, who also happened to be Muslims. And if you follow in our footsteps, and if you listen today from the deliberations from all of the expert speakers, and again, after the cross-examining of you know, what works, what doesn't work, and why, what are the contributing factors, you'll find a common thread amongst all the individuals, and certainly through the individuals that I've worked with. The conversations that I've had with young men and women over the last 14, 15 years, not just here in the UK, but right across the world, in the Middle East, in Southeast Asia, in Afghanistan, and in particular here in, in, in Europe, in the UK, it's all been about what's been happening with the war on terror, since the war on terror. The majority of grievances the frustrations come out of what was born, the, the, you know, the weapons of mass destruction. You know, we can all say that, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot, of, a lot of vulnerabilities, it's mental health issues, it's deprivation, it's alienation. There are lots of issues that are going on in our societies right across the world, and we can't address all of them. But if we go back since 9-11, and when the war on terror began, 
and we count how many terrorists we've stopped and, uh, and how, much, how much we've reduced terrorism. Can anybody tell me honestly that terrorism has reduced at any point, in any time, any amount? It's actually increased a hundredfold. And why is that? And we've got to really critically analyze the rationale and the reason behind that. It's not about just the vulnerabilities, it's about what's been going on around the world. Every young person that I spoke to, almost all of them, talk about foreign policy, the war in Afghanistan, the war in Iraq, in Syria, in Palestine, and the conspiracy theories, and we can call them conspiracy theories. But for the young men and women that I've worked with, those conspiracies are a reality. You go onto YouTube, you go onto some of these uh, channels, where you've got Americans, you've got British soldiers, you've got other uh, Western forces that are talking about what they've been doing. You know, the, 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 the kill team, the, the grass cutters that were called, the, you know, the drone operators, were known as the grass cutters. Cut the grass while it's short. Keep it short. And they're referring to young Afghan kids. You know, these are realities that we have to sometimes understand. And when we, when we are trying to counter violent extremism, if we forget the reality of the individual, what that person's reality is, and we talk about deprivation and alienation, and maybe a mental health issue, or have been bullied in school, we forget the bigger picture. And if we don't examine the realities of those individuals, if we don't feel the pain of that person, then I'm afraid anything we're going to do to counter violent extremism is going to fail miserably. If we go back over the last, let's say, seven, six, seven, eight years, and our policies and our methods to tackle this issue of violent extremism, has it helped? Has it decreased the issue we have here in our country? It has not. Because we are failing to recognize and appreciate the reality of the individual, the pain of that young man or that young woman. I'm not condoning what they're doing for one minute. What I'm saying is that unless we understand what is going on within that individual, we are not going to be able to address the problem. It's the conversations that we must have, uh, because conversations uh, have seemed to be contagious over time. The Syrian conflict, you know, the, 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 the rebellion, it didn't just start out of just an idea and all of a sudden next day you've got people marching on the streets. There was conversations being had at coffee shops and barber shops and little restaurants and little, you know, uh, uh, residents. Those conversations became so contagious that it led to a rebellion. And then the conflict ensued. It's the same way how terrorists come up with these ideas and then they lead into conversations. If we don't have those very harsh and very real conversations with our target audience, be it young Muslims, be it young white kids that are joining far-right organizations, then I'm afraid we are, you know, we are very far from addressing this problem. It's just called you know, um, peacemaking. And unfortunately, a lot of the policies that are coming out of our governments at the moment, and we'll examine that today, are not really designed, are not really targeted to tackle the problem. They were originally, and we'll see that today. And today's conference is not just about talking about the problem, what's happening in other parts of the world, how are we addressing it, what are the contributing factors. We're going to talk about and examine why has the policy worked in a certain country and why isn't it working in here? How uh, we can rehabilitate and reintegrate? Or should we just all lock them up? Or should we go what the, the, one of the ministers said, kill all the terrorists? Can we really kill our way out of this problem? Can we arrest our way out of this problem? I'm afraid not. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a lot more detail today. So without further ado, and I'm sorry for my um, bit of emotions there, but every time I talk about this, it always, um, it always leads me to sort of dig deep down as to why did I actually travel to Afghanistan. And then I reflect on some of the individuals that I've worked with. Why did they travel to Syria? Why did they do that? And it's not always the same story. But I found that commonly, in a lot of cases, 
It is about their emotions and it's about what's happening around the world. So excuse me for that. But let's, uh, let's get back into today's session. And we're going to talk about the key contributing factors to terrorism and radicalization today. What is driving the ideology? What are the processes? And I think we have to look at that and the experts that we've called are people that, you know, we've all come, you know, IOHR and myself, we, we sat down and discussed who are the right people to call in the room. And I know that the people on this, on this panel today know what they're talking about. I know Raffaello and Paul and, and Shima. And you know, you've, you've traveled the world and you've, you've spoken at many, many different venues and conferences. And you are considered as, you know, well-grounded and well-knowledgeable. And I believe that and I've got to respect that. And let's, let's talk about these key contributing factors and let's examine them at the end of today's session. So if I can ask Raffaello to start off. Hi. Good morning, everyone. My name is Raffaello Pantucci. I'm Director of International Security Studies at the Royal United Services Institute. And it's a great pleasure and honor to be with you here today on a very distinguished panel, uh, on a very distinguished day with lots of other prominent and excellent speakers who I know and, and respect. And, um, and coming back to my alma mater at King's is always a pleasure. It's also very conveniently close to the office, which of course helps uh, in terms of guaranteeing uh, my attendance. Um, what I wanted to briefly talk about today was first talk a little bit about uh, RUSI and some of the work that we do at RUSI looking at countering violent extremism. I then want to talk a little bit about some of these contributing factors. Um, I then want to touch a little bit on my ideology and then finally I want to touch on the internet. Um, and I'll keep my comments quite concise and fairly short. Um, and I'm sure Hanif will throw something at me if I'm going wildly over time. So to start with, RUSI, we are a think tank based here in London. Uh, we are the oldest security think tank in the world, a claim that I have made in many different international forums and no one has challenged me yet, so it must be true. Um, we were founded back in 1831 um, and we do a lot of work looking at security questions and looking at countering violent extremism and understanding how violent extremism is expressing itself around the world is one of the major themes of the work that we do across the Institute. To give you two examples of recent projects that we did looking at some of these questions, uh, we recently completed a large study looking at the radicalization of Central Asian labor migrants in Russia, which is an incredibly complicated project, uh, which you can imagine in the context of a British think tank working with Russian think tanks looking at difficult security questions inside the Russian Federation. Um, and that was a, a big study. We did uh, over 200 interviews out on the ground. We commissioned Central Asian researchers to go out and do the interviews. Um, and it was trying to understand the degree to which, you know, this question of labor migration and the experiences of labor migrant was having an impact on these, some of these individuals making the choice to go and fight in Syria and Iraq. Um, another project uh, that we uh, completed recently was looking at the phenomenon of radicalization amongst IDPs in Iraq. Um, so looking at how internally displaced people within Iraq uh, were being impacted and how radicalization was taking place amongst those communities and feeding some of the narratives that we see driving groups like ISIS. On the other side of the coin, we're also very active in terms of doing uh, countering violent extremism. We're trying to work with individuals and practitioners who are working on the ground, which is something we do in a sort of policy advice way here in the United Kingdom. But we have an office in Nairobi, which is very active in terms of doing uh, CVE work in the Horn of Africa. And we deliver a global CVE training program that we've done in a number of different contexts around the world, trying to help people developing programs to do CVE, uh, to understand some of the principles that might help them shape some of their work. So that gives you, I hope, a little bit of the context of where I'm coming from in, in terms of my comments. Um, but now to sort of track back, to talk a little bit about some of the contributing factors. Um, now, Hanif, in, in, in your very emotional remarks to get us going uh, for the day, I think you made some uh, very clear points about the sort of impact of uh, foreign policy in particular as a driver as to why people are being motivated to join extremist groups. And there's no doubt that that is... Uh, the case in, in some individuals that we see being drawn towards extremist groups, be it Al-Qaeda, be it ISIS, or be it other sorts of ideologies. But I think the other interesting thing, if you look at the research around what drives people towards joining extremist groups, um, one of the most sort of obvious points that you can draw from it is that there is no single narrative and there is no single story. The reality is when we're looking at the phenomenon of violent extremism, radicalization to violent extremism, it turns out that there are lots and lots of different factors, and it's very different in every single case. Depending on where you're looking around the world, different factors can have a different impact. Depending on which individuals you're talking to, you'll find that some will be more motivated by ideologies, some will be more motivated by the people that they know, and the sort of communities that they come from. And they're, you know, maybe their cousin's gone off to fight in Syria and Iraq, and he's having a really good time. They were always very close to him, and so that draws them to go out there. In other cases, we see people really are bought into the more ideological motivations that draw people towards it. And that's the sort of one universal thing you can really draw 
from all of the endless amounts of research and ink that has now been spilled in terms of looking at questions of violent extremism. And I mean, an interesting factor is you can also notice is that in some contexts, a factor which seems irrelevant in one context will be much more important within another. To give you one specific example from the work that we recently done, this, the project I mentioned looking at the radicalization of Central Asian labor migrants in Russia, one of the interesting factors that we drew out of that was that it turns out that money is a bit of a motivator for some of these individuals. So economic incentives, the idea of going off to fight in Syria and Iraq because there's some money to be made doing that because it's a better economic opportunity than the one that they're experiencing where they are in Syria and Iraq or where they are in Syria and Russia or back in Central Asia is something that does seem to be a genuine uh, factor. In contrast, most studies you see looking at the West will dispute and disagree with this context entirely. You know, there's very few young men who've gone to fight in Syria and Iraq from the United Kingdom who went because they thought there was a better paycheck to be had there than there is here. So, you know, these sorts of factors are very different in lots of different contexts. And that, I think, makes it very complicated in terms of trying to figure out what the appropriate response might be. Because the problem is it has to be very site-specific. So when you're thinking about developing a, violent ex a countering violent extremism program, or you're thinking about how to address the factors in a specific context, you really do have to understand that kind of micro context and that micro environment to be able to understand how you're going to shape your response appropriately. So if we can't really, if, if there is no clear motivation, there is no clear definition around the exact factors that are driving people towards it, one of the questions which we've started to look at at RUSI, and I think a lot of other researchers as well, I wouldn't say we're unique in this, is trying to understand the process a little bit more. You know, how is it that people are actually being drawn towards these ideologies. So rather than focusing maybe just on the sort of factors, you know, is it economic incentive or something else, it's a question of looking more at sort of a broader range of factors that are, um, that are driving people towards this. And we've sort of grouped in our research uh, these factors around four different sort of baskets of issues. The first is what we call structural motivators, the kind of push factors. You know, so these are sort of specific contextual environmental issues that are driving people towards being attracted towards extremist groups. The second is individual incentives, and this more drills down to the individual cases. You know, really, when we look at sort of these extremist groups, you know, they are sort of mass movements of people, but at the end of the day, it is lots of individuals who've been drawn up in this sort of mass uh, ideology and in this sort of shift. And so there you look down at the individual context of why an individual has been drawn towards the group, and this is more the kind of pull factor side of the equation. A third aspect that we try to focus on is the question of enabling factors. So are there presence of issues and factors in the broader environment that the individual is coming from that will encourage them to be drawn towards uh, some of these uh, extremist ideologies? And then finally, there is this sort of counterpoint to all of this, which is the resilience side of the equation. And when we're thinking about resilience, resilience is much more, why do people not go and join? You know, if we think about the sort of uh, reasons that we give for why people are drawn towards extremist groups, what's often fascinating about them is the fact that these are things that m a lot of people within society will feel. And yet only a very small group from within that broader pool will actually make the decision to go and join an extremist organization. To return to the research we did looking at Central Asian labor migrants, you know, uh, the reason we did this was because this was a thing we kept noticing was coming up in the individual narratives and stories of people who were going, who were showing up in Syria and Iraq from Central Asia. A lot of them had been labor migrants in Russia, and so we're saying, well, what is the kind of the unifying factor behind all of that, why they're going? But you know, one has to be very careful when doing this research and therefore concluding that the entire group is a problem. Because the reality is that, you know, even if you look at the lower estimates of numbers of Central Asians who are working as labor migrants in Russia, you're talking around 2 million people. And that's a number that some people say is even as high as 4 to 5 million people, right? And when we think about the numbers of people who've gone to fight in Syria and Iraq, you know, uh, from who have a sort of Central Asian uh, background, you know, you're talking at most a few thousand. So, you know, even if we take those, you know, the upper end and the lower end on one scale, you're talking really a fraction of the community who've gone out there. So you have to be very careful to not sort of draw um, completely, you know, you have to be very careful in terms of understanding why it is some of the other people have not been drawn, and that might help you to get a better understanding of why it is that some of the individuals did go. So that's briefly on the sort of factor side of the equation. I think in terms of the ideology, what is striking to me about the ideology is how it actually, you know, broadly remains the same. Over time, we can see how specific ideologies do tend to sharpen in their kind of expression. So if we look at kind of Al-Qaeda and the narrative that it was advancing, um, it, is, uh, it does seem to be a little less sharp than the narrative and the more, much more nihilistic narrative that we see coming out of a group like ISIL. So it seems over time that these sorts of groups do sharpen their ideologies. And in a way, that's because they're responding to you know, the marketplace of ideas that they're competing within. You know, if you want to attract attention, you want to attract recruits, you want to attract funding and people, well, you have to be more extreme to be able to catch the kind of public attention. 
I think the other thing that uh, broadly remains fairly persistent when we're looking at extremist ideologies, and this is true for terrorist movements in general, is you know fundamentally these are anti-establishmentarian groups, right? The whole idea of joining a, a terrorist organization is that the current order has a sort of fundamental injustice within it that you see needs to be rectified and you want you need to do something about. It. And you're joining a small group of people, a kind of vanguard movement, who have seen this injustice and are going to try to do something about it. And so that kind of upending of the global order and this anti-establishment narrative does remain as a sort of consistent uh, narrative that we see expressing itself across ideologies. And that's something that you can see really on kind of all sides of the ideological spectrum, be it sort of Al-Qaeda or ISIS, or even if you're looking at the other side of the equation, looking at the extreme right wing. Um, again, an ideology which has sort of been fairly persistent over time, but has definitely kind of sharpened, um, sharpened over time as well, in response in some ways to the kind of political environment that we see. Um, and then the other important aspect to remember about ideology is how much ideologies will feed off each other. You know, this question of reciprocal radicalization is, is a really interesting one. This idea that, you know, you look at um, groups like Al-Qaeda, the sort of violent Islamist narrative, and, you know, for a narrative like that to succeed and thrive in a sort of Western context in particular, it needs to be able to feed off uh, a sense that, you know, the world here is really against Muslims, you know, and so it needs that kind of other extreme, the extreme right, which, you know, will show that there is a sort of anti uh, immigrant narrative and that there is a real sort of rejection of um, Islam in the West uh, to be able to help itself uh, survive. It gives it a kind of raison d'etre. So if it can point to the other side and say, well, look, you know, it's not just us who are saying these sorts of things. Actually, you can look at the society around you and see that there is that narrative out there. You know, the two will kind of feed off each other. And this question of reciprocal radicalization is a very difficult one and one that is really, I think, one that is, in, is not totally perfectly understood in terms of understanding how we're going to be able to counter um, some of these ideologies. And I think the other important thing to remember from a governmental perspective is it's very important from uh, a governmental perspective to make sure that, you know, the, the political narratives that you're advancing at a public level are not actually making the very problem you're talking about worse. You know, and this is, this is a genuine problem that we see where politicians often make sort of statements that, you know, will pretty much define the clash of civilizations narratives that these sorts of extreme, that extremist groups are often talking about, you know. So it saves them the trouble of really having to advance these ideas because they say again, we, it's not just us who are saying this, this small group. You can talk, look at what ordinary politicians are saying and they are very much making it work. And then briefly, because I know I'm coming towards the end of, uh, of my time and I, I want to uh, be prompt, I wanted to briefly talk about the internet because then the internet is often talked about a lot as uh, the sort of the big change element when we're thinking about radicalization um, and extremism and how it somehow sort of enhanced and made it so much worse. Well, I, I'd argue that, you know, to some degree, I think there's a tendency to get a little carried away uh, with the idea of blaming the internet. Ultimately, the internet is a tool, you know, and the internet is something, and then social media and how we all communicate now is something that has changed across broader society. And in many ways, we look at extremist groups, we look at terrorist groups, they are just sort of responding to that reality. You know, they operate in the same world that we do fundamentally, right? So they, when they're trying to look for recruits, when they're trying to reach out and spread their ideas, of course they use exactly the same tools that we do. And what is the big message of today is that now we are all much more interconnected, we are much more able to communicate with each other in ways that we really could not before in a much more immediate manner. So the idea that sort of terrorist ideologies and terrorist groups will move in that direction is in many ways not very surprising. And I think we have to be careful not to focus too much on the tool, but more on the ideology. But then on the other side of the equation, I think um, the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the ideology and the sort of broader factors of why people are going. But I think the other thing that we have to remember about the internet is its ability to empower uh, micro ideologies. Um, and I think this is the one interesting aspect of, of kind of how we see broader political violence shifting and how we see um, terrorism becoming more, uh, becoming a sort of more pro bigger problem is that we can see that there is a diffusion of sort of terrorist ideologies and terrorist methodologies. You know, and at the moment we see that expressing itself a lot in the case of sort of ISIS, who's able to, you know, try to manipulate people from distances, who's able to put its methodology, its terrorist tactics and practice and ideology in such a way that sort of people can pick it up and connect with it in a way that previously we didn't necessarily see happening in the same way, but they're able to, it's helped sort of magnify their capability considerably more. But there is a sort of beyond uh, the ISIS uh, expression that we see. And I'd argue that maybe you could even see this starting to happen in, in instances like the one that we saw in Toronto um, last week, or the, maybe it was two weeks ago now, uh, where we saw this individual who appeared, uh, you know, we don't know the total story around him yet, but he appears to in part have been motivated by a sort of a misogynistic ideology. 
um, and he seems to have been connected to other people online. And this sort of helped empower what is fundamentally a micro-ideology. It was really a one guy who had his own sort of bugbears around the world. But through the sort of the communities he could connect with online, it does give strength to that specific little micro-ideology and lead to something that leads to other people's deaths in advance, in some ways, of a political ideology. And I think going forward, this is going to be something that we're going to have to be increasingly more aware of. Um, this idea of micro-ideologies being empowered by the way that we all sort of communicate and live today, and how some of these micro-ideologies might be able to conduct deaths that will look like terrorist activity, that is comparable to what we see sort of large-scale terrorist organizations doing. And we have to be very careful to understand which it is that we're looking at and not overreact to something which is fundamentally a kind of micro-expression versus something that is much more part of a bigger trend and a bigger movement. And I will leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rafael. Uh, at least I got the uh, discussion going. Uh, I know it's just um, foreign policy is one aspect of it, and there's a number of other issues, and, and you quite rightly uh, elaborate on them. Um, we'll, we'll, um, we'll go for a panel discussion, so if we, you know, any questions or answers, we'll, we'll leave it for, for, for later on. Um, so on that, could I, could I ask, uh, I'll find stuff on my left and then work my way this way. If, if Nina, if you can carry on from where Rafael left off and uh, talk about um, what the contributing factors are to terrorism and terrorism today. I'd like to, uh, to talk um, maybe also in a kind of emotional way as well, because I think um, from my point of view, um, if we uh, lose our emotions in this kind of fear, um, we maybe lose the contact to the field as well. And um, I, I traveled a lot um, uh, all across Europe um, in the Salafi scene, and what I find out um, is really, um, it's really hard to take uh, sometimes, but I think um, when you, you start um, to lose your emotion or thinking about it, and your anger and your fear and everything that comes around when you talk to people, who are very young and who feel sometimes like they have no future, at least when, I'm, when they are 20, 20 years old. Um, you have to, um, to be uh, angry yourself. I think that's very good for us because then we can fight with them to take them back to their, to their countries and uh, to their homes. One second, Nina. Can, can you all hear, Nina? Oh, Clearly. no. Can't, can't you hear me? Yeah. No. Do you want to do it now? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. I'm sorry for that. Okay. So I start again. Uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to to focus on um, uh, today on the the young uh, girls and the women uh, with which uh, I, I conducted interviews. Um, who were part um, on the Salavi movement um, and who um, engaged themselves. I, I'm following uh, Quinton Viktorovich uh, and this uh, typology, Mr. Wagemarkers may be <laughs> not uh, uh, agree with me, um, and I call them the Salafistic uh, Jihadi um, women. So um, maybe first of all, it's, it's interesting for all of you to know uh, where, where I'm coming from. I'm a religious scientist. And uh, first of all, in the year 2011, I started um, to do a study on conversion, so-called conversion to Islam um, in, in Germany. And there, uh, to make it short, I found out um, there are two types of uh, converts in, in, in my uh, case study. One um, that um, converted 20 years ago and who have more like a Sufi Islam feeling. Um, um, and a relationship uh, with um, their own God, Allah. And uh, the other one were um, uh, called themselves Salafi. So I was like a little bit, uh, what's going on? Because um, I know only uh, Salafs um, in Jordania and in uh, Egypt as well, but not in this huge amount in Germany. So I became really curious about these uh, 38 persons I um, uh, conducted interviews uh, with, and I started to do my uh, PhD research um, about uh, Salafism in Germany. And then, uh, to be curious, <laughs> became a huge problem for me because uh, then I talked to someone, uh, for example, in Cologne, in the west of uh, Germany, and he told me, oh, uh, I have a good friend from uh, Sharia for UK, and maybe you want to talk to him as well. And I said, well, okay, <laughs> why not? That might be interesting. So um, I did 
a little bit too much research, uh, all in all 175 interviews uh, across uh, Germany <laughs> and eight European countries. And um, there were so many research fields. When you first started, you're interested in the motives, you're interested, for me as a religious scientist, why are you feeling uh, you have to go from uh, Islam to um, the Salafi interpretation of it? And then uh, you're looking at mosques, uh, where are they, where could they? Uh, you're looking, uh, which I find much more interesting, um, beside the mosque area and this private spheres, um, what are they talking about? And then you're looking at uh, how do they live? I lived uh, in the Bonneus, for example, um, when I was uh, there in France, because I wanted to feel how they feel. And I wanted to see um, the world um, through the eyes um, of my uh, interview partner. So. I try to, <laughs> at least. And uh, another part is very interesting. Um, if you look at Salafi uh, families, there's a difference um, between their view of the world and the single persons who look um, on the world through this lens from the Salafi movement. So um, I think uh, this is a, a, a really interesting uh, term as well, a, a mujahidat, a mujahidat. <coughs> When you look at the media, and maybe this might be a huge problem, um, although we're living in the 21st century, who is a mujahida? Um, they think um, she's a, a girl, a woman who wants to kill, who wants to fight, but it is really true. And I think I stick to that, uh, what uh, Kadia said. Um, a mujahida is someone who wants to engage herself, but now we come to the point when we, saw, when we talk about these um, uh, jihadistic uh, movements. This engagement, which comes from a good, very good root, will be led to something very bad. And um, here we have the famous Al Khansa uh, uh, Brigade, uh, some pictures of them, because uh, most of the Belgian, uh, the French, and uh, uh, some of the English uh, interviews, um, um, interview partners wanted to join uh, uh, the El Hensa Brigade, the women. Why did they want to join it? But it's very interesting because, uh, first of all, the El Hensa Brigade ga um, goes to Iraq and Syria and took um, uh, some of the um, women who were uh, prostitutes before. And uh, when um, uh, Daesh came uh, into Iraq and Syria, uh, they asked them, uh, would you like uh, to, to be stoned? Or would you like to join the brigade? So they joined the brigade. And after a while, they were very cruel against all the others, mocking about them when they've been uh, prostitutes. And so they, they become a very strict, very cruel uh, brigade. And why do those, uh, those um, British, those French, those Belgian girls want to join this crew brigade? That's a question we have to discuss. Um, jihad is a, another very um, interesting term, I think, because when you, again, I'm not mocking every time at the media, I'm sorry for this, there are some who are quite okay. Um, but. Um, if you're looking at this term, everybody tells us jihad is something like the holy war, which is not. Um, uh, we have so many uh, ways to do jihad. And when you look at the media, um, for example, um, there are invitations for one uh, Muslim in a late night show and all the others are non. And um, the anchor is asking, oh, so a fellow Muslim, <laughs> what about the jihad? <laughs> what shall he say? What shall I say if I'm a Muslima? Okay, on the, on the one hand, we have fallen to this uh, pyramid. We have uh, Jihad al-Akbar. It's one thing every Muslima, every Muslim has to do to become a better um, um, believer. It's like in Christianity, uh, I'm a religious scientist. In every other religion, you have to do um, uh, what Allah, what God, whoever told you to become a better person, a better believer. So when you're at this late, late night show in a Europe, uh, country, European country, you can't say you're against the jihad because the jihad is something you are living with when you're a believer. 
But if you say jihad is a part of my life, maybe the police will carry you away afterwards. Um, and if you don't say so, and it's, uh, it's not depending on if you're an orthodox or if you're a liberal or Muslim, um, your imam will tell you afterwards, why did you tell <laughs> all those people you're doing jihad? Because you're doing the jihad al-Akbar. So you were in a struggle. And, and, and that's where Muslim, most of my friends are Muslim. I, I grew up in a, as I may say this personal note at this point, um, I grew up in an area in the west of Germany, it's called the Ruhr area in, in, in Germany. And most of um, those persons come from an origin from, from Turkey, a Hanafi uh, Islam. And when you talk to them, jihad is something normal. I grew up that jihad is something normal. And then I come to this, um, to this uh, research and uh, suddenly uh, we see it in black and white. Are you against or are you uh, for jihad? But life is not to be for or against something. It's to be, or in my point of view, to, to, to get along with uh, several kind of possibilities. Jihad al -Ak uh, el uh, um, as, uh, as a competition between religions. We never talk about it, but we have the whole day long when, uh, when a, a, a rabbi is talking to an imam, they are, they are doing jihad al-kabir uh, because uh, they're saying, okay, my religion is better because of these points, no, mine, and so on. Uh, we have to keep this in mind. And only the small uh, part of this pyramid, jihad al sagia is something which has um, uh, a lot of um, rules to follow if you want to join the real jihad. I'm not only doing uh, my academic research, I also do uh, try to do some uh, prevention work as well. And when you talk to some girls, some uh, boys who wanted to go uh, abroad, who wanted to, um, to join uh, the former Jabhat al Nusra Fund, and he said, okay, I have to do something, I have to fight. I have to fight for all my fellow Muslims. Uh, then you can ask why. When you're leaving and you, you are having this concept of Jihad al sagi in your mind, um, what is with your wife, what is with your parents, who will uh, pay for them, who will um, look uh, about them, and uh, what is Daesh really doing? Is Daesh uh, following the rules you have to um, follow when you're going to the jihad uh, as Hagir. No, because it's fighting against all the other fellow Muslims. And that is not allowed in this concept of jihad as Hagir, for instance. Just a few examples. Um, um, here we have an example, um, all um, names are um, anonymous, anonymized, I'm sorry. Um, a 20 year old student. So what we do have uh, deconstruct is that um, members of the Salafi movement are stupid. That is not true. I talk mostly to very clever women. They know what they want. They learn Arabic, which is a really hard language to learn, I know it by myself. And um, they want to engage themselves. Um, they get in touch uh, via so many ways. Here it is um, uh, via social media. And what we see here is um, uh, when, they, when you ask them, why do you want to go there and why do you want to maybe also die for Islam? They are very young. Uh, they are 21, 19, 16, what age? Um, and they say, um, it's, it's my only chance to be a good person. But maybe there might be other possibilities to become a good person, to become a good um, a, a fellow for all your, uh, for um, the environment. Um, another um, a case study, for example, is a Belgian uh, female uh, I, I talked to. And she um, got in touch with uh, Jabal al Musa. It's now Daesh uh, al Fatah, Asham. And um, she wanted to have her own family. If you see it, um, she is arguing with um, Abdullah Asam's father, Al Ain. Um, everybody has to do the smaller jihad. It's a Fat Al Ain, it's an individual uh, debt to do so. A French example, um, she was a girl who was very pretty, 
um, living in a world very um, superficial and uh, somehow uh, she thinks that it's not enough. I'm not just only um, a pretty girl, but uh, there should be something, something more for me. And um, she did something which you can see very often. Um, the former life, the former family is dead. It's not existing anymore. And maybe here uh, we could, could go inside and, and say, why? Uh, please um, and, um, explain it to me. Why is the former family dead? Is this an Islamic value, for sure? Um, a lot of uh, uh, girls um, have been married uh, to Syria, have been married to Iraq. Um, it's, um, marriage is, uh, is something uh, which is very worthy in Islam. Um, and um, um, all the sisters are trying to help each other to find um, a real man, uh, a lion, someone uh, who can be relied on. And uh, why the, a lion? A lion because um, they are in search of a strong person. Why are they in search for a strong person? They can be a strong person themselves. But um, they think it's, it's, it's better when you come from an environment and you've lost um, all your strengths there because of uh, sexual abuse, for example. A lot of girls I talk to um, uh, have been victims of uh, sexual abuse. And um, this is also maybe for the um, psychologists um, a very huge field to discover, a very huge field to um, where, you could, where you could help those girls, as a Spanish girl. Um, she is a native uh, Muslima, but she uh, told me that she has, has gone a, a away from the real Islam, and after a while um, she got in touch with the real uh, Salafi movement, with the real Islam, and um, it, she is so um, engaged, maybe you could say, that she wanted to be um, a very good wife, a very good believer, and wanted to do everything that um, maybe uh, God uh, would appreciate, and also her man. She has no self-esteem, and also we're talking, or me, I'm talking about uh, women and girls at this point. Um, uh, it, it's very, very um, important to give them self-esteem back. So I'm coming to the end. Um, they see themselves as um, someone um, being as a migrant, but the public is seeing them as a fighter. So we have to be um, in between there and to try to, to break up, to deconstruct this link. So I have um, some kind of uh, typologies, uh, like other colleagues here as well found out. Um, I think um, the recruiter one um, is, from my point of view, from my experience, a very hard part because they're very clever. Uh, they are very often not so religious as they pretend to be, but all the others are believing that the sister uh, is knowing what is going on. The sister is knowing what to do. Not the imam, not the Salafi preacher, but the sister knows what to go, uh, what what is going on. So um, we have to to stick to this point from my point of view to to get uh, through the uh, recruitment. So um, another point, um, as a last uh, a moment from a religious scientist perspective, uh, the camel fright uh, from Aisha going on a camel and um, trying to win the fight, only for just a few uh, seconds when you're reading the Sira, but it was a very um, a clear position for a girl. And this is a very um, hard uh, construct um, in um, Islamic uh, theology to deconstruct uh, the Aisha perspective. When you talk to Salafi preacher, the man, they will never say that Aisha is a very um, 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 expressive girl. We will never talk about it. It never happened that Aisha uh, was someone who was going to the fight. But when you talk, with someone from the same uh, Salafi movement, from um, uh, the women, they will name this Aisha uh, point, and they will know it, and they will um, uh, use it as a role model. So um, 
when we see that there is um, a lot of energy and there's a, a lot of potential um, in between those young uh, girls and women, um, we can try, from my point of view, I, I try every day, I, I try to do it with the parents because um, I think we should never give up, never. Whatever happens, we can achieve it all together uh, if, we, if we are working on the same goal, which sometimes differs a lot from my point of view and experience. Um, we have to canalize this negative energy in something um, worthy, in something worthy for all of us in social um, participation. And what is one of uh, the main points here is that you have to say, um, when you are going to jihad, it should be clear for you that you have to kill everybody who is not on your side. That includes your parents, that includes everybody uh, of your beloved. You have to be aware of this when you are going there. Are you aware of it? And I think this might be a very good um, deconstructive way because they have to think about it with their hearts, with their souls and with their minds. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. So if we start off with Lorenzo, please. I know you've got to go, so Lorenzo, please. Uh, let's hear from you about... It's about preventing violent extremism and counterterrorism measures. What has worked and what has not? Any analysis that focuses only on grievances, I think, would be, uh, would be remiss, would, be, um, would fall a bit short in trying to see the, the full picture. There's something else uh, which is ideology, which is what makes sense of the grievances. I think, as, as we all know, uh, not everybody that suffers from, uh, uh, that has this, the grievances that many people have, whether it's foreign policy, poverty, that end up radicalizing. They do buy uh, into an ideology uh, which has good diagnostic uh, frames and good prognostic frames. Makes sense of the problem, makes sense of the grievances, whether they are structural or personal, and then explains what the, the enemy is, what the conspiracy uh, behind, uh, in, many, in many cases in a very conspiratorial way, uh, and then sort of gives uh, a vision for what the world, society should or would uh, look like if, anybody, if everybody followed uh, this ideology. There's a final aspect, though, which I think is often overlooked, uh, which is the mobilizational aspect. Uh, in many cases, we see that radicalization is about who you know. Uh, people radical, with exceptions, of course, uh, but no man's an island. People do radicalize because they are in one way or the other, and of course, the internet has played a huge role over the last 10, 15 years in amplifying that. You radicalize because you know somebody um, who's already embracing a certain view. And I think that, uh, and third layer, I think it's very important also when it comes to prevention and explains a lot of the, uh, the questions that do exist when it comes to radicalization. Uh, let's look, at, for example, at the um, Syrian-Iraq related mobilization of the last few years, so the foreign fighters from a, West, from a European perspective. Uh, one question that has puzzled a lot of people is why do we see different distributions of mobilization in different countries. If you do what uh, law enforcement intelligence agencies do, which is a mapping of how people mobilize in different countries, you will see in all countries an uneven distribution uh, and the presence of certain hubs. Uh, it's one topic that I and other researchers have looked for quite a bit. How do you explain, for example, that in a country like, like Italy, but I can take many others, uh, you have seven foreign, it's, Italy is at a very tiny mobilization compared to other countries, uh, which is in itself a very interesting dynamic because we've seen 129 individuals from, from Italy where from every point of view, integration, access to education, employment are pretty bad. And you had 350 in neighboring Austria, which fares much better. You had much higher number in Scandinavian countries, whether you take in absolute or in relative terms. Uh, but on an Italian perspective, you will see that, for example, a small town called San Donato del Piave, which very few people in this room would have ever heard of, uh, um, have seen seven or eight individuals leave. Another town called Ravenna has seen 11 or 12 leave. Rome has seen one, Naples zero. And how do you explain that? You know, if you get into deep sociological analysis, it makes very little sense. Uh, of course, there are people who uh, feel discriminated in, uh, in every place uh, in Italy. Of course, there are 
issues with socioeconomic deprivations, which are arguably stronger in Rome or Naples than in relatively affluent towns like San Donato del Piave and, and, and Ravenna. But again, you can apply that analysis to any country. Yet you have this relatively larger mobilization in, uh, in both towns. Uh, and I think it probably has to do with the human factor, the fact that in both towns you had charismatic individuals that attracted people around themselves who exploited uh, real or perceived, in many cases very real, grievances that people had, uh, made them through their charisma, um, made them bind to a certain, uh, a certain ideology and then recruited them and mobilized them. Uh, so it's, it's very complicated, and I said it's very country, uh, it's very context specific, but I think the three aspects should be looked at, and I think that leads to the, the if, because we're here to talk about prevention, obviously the idea is uh, how do we prevent, how do we, uh, if radicalization is about at least these three macro factors, the grievances, the ideology, the mobilization, how do you work on all three? Uh, and that's the big, big, uh, big question. Um, the other part that I was asked to, to describe was uh, the, um, some of the prevention strategy in place. Uh, the two countries I've had the pleasure of working in, I divide my time between Italy and the United States, are uh, oddly enough, even though they have very different circumstances, very different political contexts, very different threats, uh, the reality is that they are two of the a few Western countries left that have not really had a serious attempt at creating a counter-radicalization strategy. For very different reasons, they have uh, both uh, focused very much on the repression side of things, but they have not developed a coherent counter-radicalization strategy. Uh, from an American perspective, I think there's long been the idea, uh, first of all, that uh, radicalization uh, when it comes, of course, to, let's call it to jihadist-inspired radicalization, that it's something that happens only in Europe, because European Muslims are poorly integrated, American Muslims are well integrated, therefore uh, there's no need to do this kind of work in the US, which is, I think, a sort of a, um, a reasoning which is flawed in many, on many levels, including the fact of seeing lack of, radical, a lack of integration as directly linked to, uh, to integration. And of course, the facts over the last few years have proven that we've seen plenty of cases of radicalization in the United States uh, as well. Um, around 250 Americans traveling to, to, to Syria and Iraq, and we have seen around 15 attacks, some of it quite important, like Orlando, like San Bernardino, like Chattanooga, uh, like, um, that have seen uh, US individuals uh, involved in them. Uh, the second aspect is, of course, the very delicate political nature that the assessment of radicalization in the U.S. brings, and, of course, the issue of right-wing extremism uh, with sort of the very sensitive political debate that that triggers. So if you have, uh, I think in most countries in, your, in, uh, in Europe, we, we, we have fully understood that a sound counter-radicalization strategy applies to all forms of extremism and radicalization, not just religiously inspired. Uh, I think in the U.S., whenever that point has been raised that there should be some kind of preventive uh, system, not just for jihadist inspired, but also for a very, very large issue of right-wing uh, extremism, that point becomes political, uh, uh, politically toxic. Uh, that leads to the idea also that uh, everything could be, de could be dealt with through the repressive uh, approach. And indeed, the U.S. Uh, counterterrorism system has tools which are significantly stronger than those that any European country possesses. It's that you don't have to go back to the Patriot Act. Uh, there's uh, a lot of things that US authorities can do that uh, your very European counterparts cannot do, which has led to sort of this idea that they can arrest their way out of the, out of the problem, which is not universally shared, of course, and I think most people operating on the ground will understand that that's not how it is. But at the policy-making level, uh, I think that idea is that we got a tough FBI, we arrest everybody. Indeed, you get around 25, 30 years in prison, uh, in most cases for activities that in Europe would get you 18 months, a couple of years at most. Uh, disseminating jihadist propaganda, that kind of things would get you 25 years in the States, uh, with material support clause. And the idea is we basically do not need to do prevention, we have repression, we do not need to do any kind of also de-radicalization work. Uh, we simply put them in prison and toss away the key. Uh, now, there's many indications that show that that is not necessarily uh, the case. We all understand why uh, prevention is important. There's uh, 
an issue sort of coming up from a de-radicalization point of view in the states, which is uh, making this whole assumption uh, uh, crumble. Uh, there's going to be around uh, uh, 67 individuals who are going to be uh, released from prison over the next uh, next few months. These are mostly people who are incarcerated after 9/11 uh, and sort of the dragnet that came after after the attacks. Uh, the U.S. has absolutely no program for any kind of rehabilitation or de-radicalization in the prison system. Uh, so people are coming out, and if they have de-radicalized, it's on their own, and that's great. If they have not, they have not. Uh, and there's really no system to sort of uh, uh, look into that. But a little personal uh, anecdote, we, uh, a year and a half ago, the center I run in D.C. hired uh, an individual which was... Um, sort of an Al-Qaeda link recruiter uh, in the US, uh, uh, fairly normal in the UK, I understand, uh, not very common in the US. Um, not only the action was not necessarily widely supported, uh, but it, it, we realized uh, that the system there, it really makes it very difficult for people who uh, try to get out of, of a certain milieu to then, then re reintegrate it into society. Uh, not only does nothing of support from an ideological point of view, but there are certain parts of uh, the day-to-day -day system that comes with people who get parole or get released that makes it very difficult to be re-included in, in society. And I think that's one of the big questions, but I think some parts of the U.S. counterterrorism establishment understand, uh, some other do not. Uh, if I move to the Italian setting, you would get very different dynamics, but at the end of the day, the same conclusion. We can, if not arrest our way out of the, prob uh, the problem, we can deport our way out of the problem. Uh, the Italians deport, on average, two individuals a week. Uh, we're now at the end of April. There's been 37 individuals deported for national security reasons from Italy. It's, uh, it's a very effective tool, indeed. I'm not, I'm not criticizing that. Uh, it has allowed Italy, I think it's one of the main reasons that it has allowed Italy to be knock on wood, not yet having suffered any attack, or uh, having seen these lower levels of radicalization, uh, but it only applies because the vast, vast majority of, uh, of individuals who are radicalized are not citizens of the country. And there are many indications that this is sort of a, something that will change uh, in, the coming, in the coming years, and sort of a short-sighted approach, if it's not accompanied by, uh, by prevention. Uh, which, of course, has led me to think a lot, because these are the two countries in which I, I really work. Uh, what are the lessons learned from other countries that could be applied? There's always an advantage uh, in, being, uh, in being late, is that you can learn from the guys who are pioneered and who have tried and in many ways stumbled. Uh, and I think that the UK is a very good example of that, in which we have seen many reiterations of, of prevent and uh, try to see what works, what doesn't. Uh, uh, try to empirically assess what works and what doesn't, which of course politics coming in the way uh, in the process, but that's, that's the nature of the, of the business. Uh, and of course there's no, um, there's no one, uh, one answer. Uh, I think the, uh, where sort of a common, uh, common ground is, is found is the fact that because radicalization happens for many complex reasons, it happens at different levels, you have to operate on all these levels, from the macro, uh, indeed, there are uh, issues of, uh, of discrimination, of lack of opportunities. I think you, you were alluding that in your, in your presentation uh, of foreign policy, which need to be worked on for what is possible, of course. Um, but it's obviously not just about that. I think there's much more ground that's been uh, explored, and I think with some successes when operating at the micro level in sort of the one-to-one -one work. Uh, that has been done in a variety of countries. I think the UK is a pioneer on that with, again, ups and downs, pros and cons. Uh, countries like, the, uh, like Denmark or the Netherlands have been working uh, on uh, ameliorating, perfecting is a big word, but uh, improving their uh, approaches in finding individuals who are in the early stages of a radicalization trajectory and to some degree refining an approach in how to engage with them, understanding that there's no one solution, there's no one approach, that what will work with individual A will not work with individual B, and there will be individual C who will not uh, progress on the radicalization trajectory no matter what you do. Uh, it's not a process of uh, threat elimination, it's threat reduction here. Uh, I think it is really on this sort of one-to-one 
uh, interventions where a lot of, and I see it comparatively in different European countries, where a lot of the, the energy is focused in trying to develop, develop systems that in a very tailored way bring together the expertise of individuals that range from uh, psycho psychologists and psychiatrists to communities to formers uh, uh, to individuals with a theological background to social workers uh, and, and in many cases other kind of individuals uh, in having this approach. Uh, it is a work, obviously, that is best done away from the spotlight. It's a work that is best done away from the, the cameras and the politicians. Uh, but I think that's the part where I'm somewhat encouraged that we have seen uh, some pretty good results. I, I, um, last week I was in, in Denmark uh, for sort of the, the, the big uh, prevention conference there. And that's a country that has invested quite a bit on prevention. Nothing is perfect. They, can, uh, they could, could obviously acknowledge they could do things better, but there's tangible results that without getting in large social engineering uh, uh, programs, which are difficult to do and probably not necessary, uh, or anyways, if done, not necessary part of a, as part of a counter-radicalization strategy, uh, but when you focus on the, the individual, uh, there's, there's room for optimism, there's room for success in Central Asia, in the UK. And the main point, the main springboard from which all the other motivational factors and the mobilization factors and the ideological factors arise is the grievance. Every single individual that we've worked with, and I think there's many in this room that can agree, is that the main springboard for uh, them to be joining up or to think uh, from an extremist uh, point of view is about a grievance. Bosnia, Chechnya, Kashmir, Palestine, Syria, Afghanistan, the, you know, the numbers go on. So although there are a number of other contributing factors, I think we have to understand, and I'll go back to the point that I made in the morning, is that grievances are, are, are the one main issue that we are all forgetting a lot. So we have Mr. Mirza uh, from uh, Bosnia, Herzegovina, project coordinator uh, from the IOM, International Organization of Migration, to talk about the prevention element that um, is working uh, or not working in, uh, in that part of the world. Thank you for inviting me to participate in this conference and share the experiences in behalf of the International Organization for Migration on the work that we have been doing uh, for the past two and a half years uh, on the prevention of violent extremism, mainly in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but in time uh, the project has increased to other Western Balkans countries as well. Just to briefly uh, give an introduction uh, to the context and why we uh, decided to work uh, on the PVE side uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina in 2012 and 13, uh, numbers of individuals started with more and more going with the increase of ISIS uh, to Syria and Iraq, and, but also on the other side we had individuals also traveling to Russia and Ukraine to fight there. So, uh, for, from that perspective, uh, we decided that there is a need for uh, doing a work to address the issue uh, because uh, no work has been done in this field in the country except certain cases where the state institutions uh, brought their own measures in terms of convicting and prosecuting individuals who became uh, foreign terrorist fighters. Mm -hmm. But from our perspective, uh, the security approach was good on one side, but we understood that there is a need for to understand the issue from another level or another dimension and trying to understand more what drove these individuals of becoming foreign terrorist fighter or what does uh, lead individuals of becoming at risk, falling under risk of violent extremism in different forms. When it comes to Bosnia and Herzegovina, just to mention, highlight that it was very important to understand the local context, also considering the war in the 90s, which is a trigger and a factor of uh, many, as Mr. Kadir mentioned, grievances on all sides. So we have three ethnic groups in the country. So from the perspective of IOM, it was also important not to uh, target, address the project that we have developed only on working on the religious perspective, but really trying to understand what it is that drives uh, the understand, uh, try to understand the push and pull factors that become drive individuals from different ethnic groups uh, to go on the pathway to radicalization or extremism, whether it's national or far right, whether it's religious. And what we decided is to develop a model, a pilot model for, for IOM in the country where we 
uh, work at very co base community <coughs> level. So we go really deep in the communities where individuals um, have been uh, evidence of going to foreign terrorist fight, become foreign terrorist fighters, but also evidences of far right. Uh, incidents and uh, groups that are organizing in those communities. So the work that we do is uh, basically coming from that community level and the model that we implemented uh, relies on these, uh, let's say, young leaders in each, in each of the communities. So what we did is we understood that we cannot use a single model for each of the 15 locations that we want to work in. We can't tailor it and work the same way in all the communities, but you have to contextualize it to each single community. And in order to do so, we understood we need local young leaders in those communities being able to understand the topic, being able to work on it, that and to accept that violent extremism is a problem in their community. And these uh, community liaison points are, let's say, the key uh, element of our project. They are the main like, uh, interlocutors with the communities that we work with. What's also important here to highlight is that we didn't come to each community, as I said, with already predetermined activities. We didn't come with solutions that we maybe can use from other countries. We tried to really interact from the start with the local communities, from the municipalities, social services, uh, but also work a lot from the start with young individuals trying to involve them and asking them what problems do they consider and why maybe violent extremism is a uh, problem in their community, trying to understand from them the drivers of violent extremism, trying to understand the first entry points uh, that can make the young persons uh, fall, go and become radicalized, and also learning from them which prevention models we can use to build resilience to counter the presence of extremist <coughs> groups or individuals in those communities. Uh, this first phase was very important because it enabled us to earn the trust of the communities because many times the individuals, uh, when you first time mention extremism, they relate it immediately to religious one. They don't understand that it's not only religious, that it's also this far right and nationalist as well. And this in the first phase enabled us to earn the trust of them and also at the same time raise awareness on the topic to reach a common understanding of the terminology that we want to use and uh, enable us to, to better understand that uh, the need for doing prevention work in these communities. Uh, following the results of the assessments, uh, there is, let's say, I would say, uh, kind of common uh, activities that we do across the communities. Uh, one of them are focusing on working with individuals one by one. So the fact that we have these young focal points in the communities present on a regular basis with well connections to the community actors, but also at the same time who have credibility of to reach these marginalized at risk, uh, at risk young persons in the communities work with them, uh, they are basically implementing the project. So we ourselves from the main office do not go to the field, everything is done in those local communities by the focal point to in the direct communication with these individuals. We have uh, activities based uh, to create uh, increased critical thinking of youth uh, that to make them understand that things are not always black and white, uh, us versus them, one side versus the other, which is very common in Bosnia and Herzegovina. We always divide in many groups, uh, mostly based on the ethnic side. At the same time, because the role of the media was highlighted in many of the communities as one of the first entry points, we tried to uh, create uh, media literacy workshops for, for these individuals and at the same time uh, make them create counter-narrative stories, alternative messages from their communities in order to show positive examples that they can produce. Uh, to mention here, these individual activities, uh, we do them like uh, the the process goes that we really try to target and find these individuals who are in need of participating in our activities. There are no public calls. We do not go to the principals of the schools and ask for a class to work in. Everything is done one-on-one -on -one contact by these focal points, which again enables us to reach those individuals that really need to become involved in their communities to reduce their feelings of frustration, marginalizations to belong to, uh, and create social cohesion to the community, which is, I think, very important because many times 
they don't feel that they can participate. A lot of them actually through this first assessment that we did felt appreciation that we came to them first, you know, asking them what they consider as problems and that they never were asked by anyone for themselves uh, what the issues are. Second activity, as I said, uh, that we do are so-called moving through courses to develop to, together with the IC Thinking Group here from London, also professors, uh, researchers at the University of Cambridge. We developed a specific uh, model developed so only for Boston and Herzegovina called MovieQ. If you have time, there is a short video that I can uh, play where you can see how the methodology works. As I said, it's mostly uh, changing the perception of how young people think and thinking more uh, complexly about the issues that they are facing. At the same time, we, uh, as I said, to increase the social cohesion between young individuals who are uh, frustrated, uh, unemployed, inactive, and to the community, we developed uh, so-called community dialogues where we introduce young individuals for the first time opportunities to think about their initiatives, ideas, and to present these ideas to the communities, uh, creating interactions, as I said, for many times, for most of them, for the first time in their lives, with the municipal representatives with companies with interpreters that they really understand if they have problems that they can address it to someone and this interaction has shown really good results the community has responded to the needs of these young people the participation the contributions of these local communities is around 40 percent for each idea that these young youth group uh, develop and in terms of building resilience of the community further to reduce the influence of violent extremism, we work also a lot with the parents who were presented as the major force to counter extremism in all its forms. And with the parents, we work in recognizing and addressing early signs of radicalization and extremism. And the aim was uh, creating these small local networks of individuals to really uh, go work from, from the community level because from us it was important that the community engages so if a problem occurs it's the family who notices the, it, the signs first and if they don't respond then the problems just increase so through these parents groups we also work with the police officers, social workers, psychologists, education representatives <coughs> as well and uh, these activities have led to three or four informal parents groups established at the same time, in the next period, we will also aim to, uh, based on these uh, community activities, we were asked by the institutions to develop. Now we are working on building a referral, national referral model on PVE in Bosnia and Herzegovina and working with ministries of education of including these movie queue courses to the education system, which is uh, lacking this critical thinking element. Thank you, Mirza. If I can ask um, Joanna, Dr. Joanna Goody from the, um, the European Union Agency of Fundamental Rights to, to talk. My name is Jo Goody. I'm head of the Freedoms and Justice Department at the EU Agency for Fundamental Rights. Uh, we're a totally EU-funded agency. We're in the cluster of justice and home affairs agencies of the EU, together with, for example, Europol, Frontex, Eurojust, and some others. In a nutshell, uh, if you're unfamiliar with us, we have to look at the situation of fundamental rights in the still 28 member states of the European Union, ranging from subjects to deal with equality, non-discrimination, through to asylum, migration and border issues, data protection, and many, many other areas. We are engaged in areas to do with radicalization, perhaps indirectly one might say. We've done a lot of work also in areas that deal with security. But today, because my time is brief, I'm only going to talk to you about a particular large-scale piece of quantitative research we did, which happened to include uh, Muslim respondents. So I'm changing tack a little because uh, a lot of the presentations so far have been uh, qualitative research, in-depth research, and I'm really trying to show you that there's a lack of evidence in the EU in how many communities experience their everyday lives, and particularly Muslim communities. So, in a nutshell, 
what I'm going to be talking about is results from the second European Union Minorities and Discrimination Survey that we undertook. We interviewed 25 and a half thousand people face to face in in-depth interviews which lasted uh, anything up to an hour or even longer about their everyday experiences. We concentrated on between one and three uh, groups in each member state consisting of the largest ethnic minority and immigrant groups. This ranged from the Roma in some member states to the Russian minorities in the Baltic states through to people from North Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, Turkey, you name it. Why do we collect this data? Well, if you're in the UK, you're used to very large-scale uh, surveys and administrative data that look at the experience of ethnic minorities and immigrants and the experiences of people on the basis of different religion. This only happens in a handful of other EU member states. There is a dearth of empirical evidence on which a lot of policy can be formulated. So the work we do basically feeds into uh, the work of a number of groups at EU level. We're part of the Commission's high-level group on uh, radicalisation. We present regularly to European Parliament committees, for example, on terrorism, uh, the Lieber Committee and many others that I won't go into now. So basically I'm going to focus in on the results of the European Union Minorities and Discrimination Survey with respect to the Muslim respondents, those who self-identified as Muslims amongst the 25,000 we interviewed. So of those 25,000, uh, 10,500 respondents uh, self-identified as Muslim. This covers 15 EU member states and the sample is as representative as we can get it for at least half of Muslims in those 15 EU member states. Like I said, please remember a lot of member states don't have this kind of empirical data. And it's important to notice at the bottom that slightly more than half of the respondents on average were citizens of an EU member state. So of course uh, their rights are somewhat different. I thought I'd begin with this slide. What you see in the red dot there are the Muslim respondents to our EU Midas survey. What you see in the red dash there is the general population from the European Social Survey from 2014 and it's showing trust in institutions. 10 is higher, trust zero is very low. What we see here is on average Muslims in our survey showed much higher levels of trust in institutions than the general population when we asked exactly the same questions that were mirroring the European Social Survey with our own survey. And I want you to hold on to that picture uh, because I think it's quite interesting and for many policy makers quite, quite a surprise to see that there are high levels of trust. Okay, one can argue if we're talking about uh, people who have only recently arrived in the EU they might experience policing as quite positive comparing to where they've come from. However, we're all talk also talking about second and third generation people who've been uh, in the EU member states for quite some time. One of the key areas of law in the EU is equality and non-discrimination law. And it's transposed to all EU member states. So as the Fundamental Rights Agency, the basis of what we do always has to be founded in law. So we look at the different grounds of discrimination people might experience that's covered by EU law, different domains for discrimination that's covered by EU law from looking for work, from at being at work, etc. And then we ask people themselves, if you felt discriminated against in any of these domains, why did you think that happened? And we had a whole list of multiple response options that people could respond to. Anything from their physical appearance, their first, first or last name, where they lived, etc. And then we can begin to really get the data because the hypothesis is still out there that if you are discriminated against, if you don't have equal opportunities, one assumes that you're going to experience not belonging to society, you're going to feel that uh, maybe this encourages groups within groups within groups, a small minority to feel. Uh, totally out of society. Does this lead to radicalisation? A huge question mark. So if you look at grounds for discrimination, if you can read that, what we have there when we ask people who said they were discriminated against, we took the three 
most common categories, which they said is my skin colour, it's my religion or religious beliefs, it's my ethnic origin. Of course, all of these are mixed up together. It's hard to distinguish them. So what you have on the very right there, EL stands for Greece in EU speak abbreviation. And you're seeing that in Greece, Muslim respondents in Greece, these are people predominantly from Pakistan and Bangladesh, 52% said they felt discriminated against at least once, and it was often several times in the last five years because of ethnic origin or immigrant background, 11% saying religion. Focus on the green, which is about religion, and we look at those member states where you have a long history of immigration. Uh, for example, France there, 20% saying they're feeling discriminated against because of their religion, 35% because of their ethnicity. You go over to Malta, MT, fourth from the left over there, and the overwhelming majority of Muslim respondents there said they felt discriminated against in Malta because of their skin colour. The UK, the figures are very low when we compare the UK with the other member states. And this is a representative sample of the people in these member states. In the UK, 9% were saying they felt discriminated against in relation to their religion. So it kind of puts in perspective the huge diversity within Europe. Of course, we're talking about different groups in each member state, different histories and longevities of uh, settling and being in a country. But in the UK, we predominantly interviewed Pakistani, Bangladeshi, and people of Somali origin, just as we did in Greece. EL on the right there, it was Pakistani and Bangladeshi origin. So I'll just show you a couple of other figures here. We asked about different domains that are protected under EU law. So the past 12 months and the past five years, in the past 12 months, uh, a lot of Muslims were saying they felt discriminated against when <coughs> using public or private services or when looking for work. And typically, when looking for work is a key area where people feel discriminated against, less in other domains. The differences can be broken down by member state and by group in great detail. And of course, how often does discrimination happen to you? Well, what you'll see from this pie chart here, the, the red 40% is saying in the past 12 months, if I'm just talking about the domain of work, 40% saying it happened two to five times at work I felt discriminated against. Um, the green is six to ten times. The purple is... Um, 17% is more than 10 times, and 10% will say, I feel discriminated against at work all the time. So these figures are huge, uh, and it, you can break the data down by member state to look at the differences. The reality is very, very few people report discrimination. On average, we found only 12% of people were reporting discrimination anywhere. So one might conclude high rates of feeling not, not belonging, of feeling discriminated against, but we have huge variations between member states. I'll show you a little bit of data now, because we also ask people not only about discrimination, about hate-motivated harassment and violence, and a couple of figures here. So if you look at these uh, bar charts, and I'll explain the abbreviations on the left, this is all the groups in the 15 member states where we had a majority of Muslim respondents. DE is the abbreviation Deutschland, Sub-Saharan Africans of Muslim origin. Half of them were saying in the last 12 months they'd experienced hate-motivated harassment. Below that, FI is Finland, Sub-Saharan Africans, 45% said they experienced hate-motivated harassment in the past 12 months. The average is 27%. You go way, way down, the UK, People of South Asian origin, uh, Pakistani and Bangladeshi, 15%. Huge variation, again, between the member states. And it puts in perspective, when you only look at one member state, that you can take it out of, out of context. Experiencing, though, um, violence motivated by hatred. That's the text on the right there. Thankfully, that was much lower. The average was about 2% in the last 12 months. So they'd experienced physical violence due to their ethnic or immigrant background in the 12 months before the survey. Because the figures are so low, so low even with a sample of 10,500, it doesn't make it meaningful to break those down the member state. So harassment is more meaningful to look at. But huge variations there. And then another question we asked um, about harassment and religious clothing. 
What you have there on the very left is whether people wear traditional or religious clothing. If they said yes, we asked uh, also were you harassed due to your ethnic or immigrant background. So what we see is slightly more women than men who are Muslims who wear traditional or religious clothing saying they were harassed. Only slightly more women than men. And I thought I would include this slide. We ask it for all groups from the Russian minorities through to the Roma, through to all the other surveys we do on different populations. Attitudes to violence, because this is often uh, questions that are asked. Uh, and I think it's reassuring, obviously, when you look at the last bar, acceptance of responding with violence when one's religion is insulted, 2% saying it's always acceptable. The vast majority saying it's not acceptable. These figures are very similar to the other groups we interview. So this kind of evidence, you present it to policymakers uh, to show them that you can't uh, stereotype an entire community on the basis of, of poor evidence. And I'll stop with my last two slides on police stops. The UK is currently the only EU member state that collects data and puts it in the public domain on police stops. The 27 other member states do not do this. So if you're coming from the UK context, you think it's quite normal to put this data in the public domain. It's not done in any other EU member state. So our data set is the largest data set in police stops as experienced by Muslims. So I'm just showing you a couple of slides here. So of those who were stopped by the police, we have all the data for the different groups on how often they were stopped, why they were stopped, where they were stopped. And I'm simplifying the huge data set we have here. So amongst those who were stopped, obviously some thought it wasn't profiling. And this is the highest figures I found there before the average. Again, in Greece, people of Pakistani and Bangladeshi origin, 54% said, when I've been stopped in the past five years, I thought it was because of profiling. Cyprus, very high there. Germany, Sub-Saharan Africans, very high. The UK, with this average representative sample, the figures are much lower, which may be surprising to, to a number of you. And again, about wearing uh, traditional or religious clothing uh, and being stopped in relation to the most recent police stop, you can see here that it's amongst men who wear traditional or religious clothing, um, they perceive discrimination is happening more <coughs> often than women uh, who wear religious uh, or traditional clothing. They dis experience discrimination as they perceive it when stopped by the police on average, with huge variations between member states. So of course, the simple, simple hypothesis that is put out there, of course, that experiences of discrimination or hate-motivated uh, victimisation impacts on Muslims and indeed everyone's sense of social inclusion. And my last slide, though, will show quite clearly that this is the case, but that it's much more complex when you look at the reality between member states. It's in my last slide. So what you have here in, in this uh, picture here is in blue is those Muslim respondents who said they were never a victim of either discrimination or harassment motivated by hate or violence motivated by hate. So the blue is, <coughs> I was never a victim. The red is, I was a victim of discrimination, harassment motivated by hate or violence motivated by hate. The obvious thing there the more you experience discrimination, hate motivated harassment, hate motivated violence, the less likely you are to trust. Trust scale going up there up to 10. It's a simple hypothesis that's often put out there, but I think we need to look at the data. We're going to make it available in the public domain shortly so people can look at the results by member states. They're very interesting by police stops because, of course, that data doesn't exist in most member states. It's only up, us and the Open Society <coughs> Institute that have actually collected this kind of data. It really allows you to see the differences between how different groups experience in their lives uh, in member states in the EU. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Um, quite an interesting uh, <coughs> analysis there and um, presentation. Uh, and on that note, with regards to data and uh, um, 
what's worked and what hasn't. Ian Lander, um, superintendent, now retired. Um, talk about some preventive work that we've been doing over the years. Uh, UK uh, Council Service Strategy, it's been around for quite a few years now, and it's got four what we call pillars. The police service and other partners have a part to play in all those pillars. The one I'm going to major on clearly is the prevent strategy. Okay, what's that about? Uh, stopping people becoming violent extremists. That was the term that we used back in 2005, 2007. Of late, it's changed to hit the nail, I suppose, more firmly on the head and say that it's about stopping people becoming terrorists. Okay, 2005, uh, just a quick run through. That's the kind of context we were dealing with, so fully appreciate this historical, but I think it's worthwhile going through what we went through to understand what our journey has looked like thus far. So that's what was going on in the UK. Um, busy times all round. And really, when the, uh, the Home Office, or Office for Security and Counterterrorism, came knocking on my unit's door, um, the police had a strategy for dealing with preparing for the aftermath of a, of a terrorist event. It had a strategy for pursuing bad people. It had a strategy for protecting institutions and people from terrorism, but it really didn't have anything to prevent people from becoming violent terrorists. So the Office of Counterterrorism and Security knocked on the door, and I was heading up what was called then the National Community Detection Team. And because we were already doing work with a lot of communities all over the UK, um, they asked us to do the prevent strategy. Some of you who have been in this kind of business for a while may recognise some of the names of the things we were doing back then. Um, Up Nicole was a community engagement event, it was usually held over a weekend, and we invited many members of um, the communities we delivered to all over the country to come in for a weekend and go through a terrorist incident. Because British policing, we wanted to be transparent, open, honest with people. We wanted to tell the communities what a complex and difficult situation we were dealing with. And we would often say this weekend, they'd come in and we'd take them through the whole intelligence handling, through to an event perhaps unfolding, to what they would do in the aftermath. And that's just about engagement and having a conversation with people that would perhaps go back to their communities, wherever they were, and again, have that honest discussion with other community members in terms of openness and transparency about policing. Elements, that was a, uh, an intelligence product we did that covered community attention across the UK that drilled down into individual areas. And Channel, Channel means a lot of things to a lot of people, uh, and that's still with us. Um, go quick show of hands, who has anything to do with Channel? Okay, uh, there's a few of you. Okay, so Channel for a lot of people has been quite divisive as time has gone by, um, and I'm going to go a little bit more into that uh, subsequently. And we've been doing a lot of work with young people from many, many different community groups, um, the Young People's uh, Youth Parliament, and other such groups of that. And we tried to work with as many government departments as we could, and also other community groups. I'm just going to uh, skip through this really quickly, so forgive me. Um, I'm not going to read that slide out, uh, prevent three bits of it. Responding to the ideological challenge, acknowledging that radicalism is a process, it's not an event in general terms. And the third one, to work with other institutions to strengthen them and stop people becoming terrorists. Okay, Chan, this is the big bit, I suppose, that Hanif wants me to major on in terms of what works, what doesn't work. <coughs> Excuse me, Channel was developed in 2006. I'll put a picture of the channel there because, strangely enough, the name came from when, uh, when my team were given this task of doing something different that UK police had never done before. We actually found out Rotterdam, this is where the value of kind of linking into other, other European countries or any other country in the world that's got some learning and some, uh, some experience. We found out that the Dutch uh, had been develop, uh, developing a, a programme based on supporting individuals that were vulnerable to terrorism. So we quickly went over to uh, Rotterdam where it was based, stole all their ideas, and coming back on the ferry, we scratched our heads and went, uh, what are we going to call it in the UK? Hence, channel. So that's how channel came about. We identified two pilot sites in the UK. Uh, some of my colleagues in this room may remember those. One was in Lambeth, um, South London, and the other was up in Preston in the north. We did not choose those areas because they had high areas of extremist behaviour. We chose them because at that time the local authorities appeared to be quite full of thinking about trying to do something different that we've never done before. 
the local police were engaged, and we had some traction with local community groups that we thought we could work with. Uh, in 2015, so way, way forward now, the Cancer Terrorism Security Act made it a legislative responsibility for some of our partners to engage in channel activity. So you look at national health, education, a lot of local authority work, they have an obligation to help us deliver channel and certain CT work. Um, it was always very difficult in the early days getting buy-in from some local authorities. Um, some didn't want to know because, because channel, even in those early days, came with a bit of a stigma about you targeting certain groups, you're looking to spy on certain groups, and that's a very difficult conversation we had a lot of times with a lot of communities. Um, but what is actually ch what is channel delivered? So coming back to the, the point, what works? There's been 4,000 on, uh, that's slightly um, historic figures, I think they're from 2016, so forgive me, I couldn't get any more up-to-date figures. There have been about 4,000 referrals. I have no idea if you think that's a high number or a low number. But to give you an idea, when we started in 2006 and 2007, I think in the first two years we had something like 10 referrals because it was early days, we weren't quite sure what we were doing or where we were going to go with it, um, but we were up to 4,000. 20% of them are assessed as being vulnerable. So what in broad terms, that means 20% of that number, somebody looks at the person and makes a call about what we can deliver to support them to get them out of that narrative around becoming a terrorist. And this is the process of what channel actually is. So, if I'm being frank, what we want to know, we want to know when somebody appears, and that's a different word in its own right, appears, appears to be moving down a path towards becoming a terrorist. And that's a really difficult call. So again, early days, that was around um, literally young people scribbling in their school book, um, something that was deemed to be by a teacher perhaps Certainly unhealthy, but it could be something about um, anti-Semitic, it could be far right wing support, it could be it could be anything to do with Al Qaeda back in the day, but it was something that was telling a teacher or somebody in the health sector, I'm a bit worried because this is unusual and it looks a bit unhealthy. And that's going to be a judgment call, and it's always you can't always get it right. But that's what um, that's what it starts with. Is that young person at risk of becoming a terrorist? And that is a really difficult call. So anyway, that's the process. We identify that person because somebody tells us about them. And then we sit down and we discuss, okay, are they vulnerable? So what does their family structure look like? What do we know about them as individuals? We came back to before about no one case is the same as any other. It's what do we know about that individual? Are they at risk? Is this, is this a genuine risk that they're going to go through to become a service? Again, a really difficult call. So we look at them in terms of their vulnerability. We then, as a group, look at their vulnerability and the nature of the risk. So what, what is it we think they're going to become? And then again, very, very difficult stuff. And then the important bit, what do we do to help that individual? Um, and again, back in the early days, what did we look at? We looked at all sorts of things from, I suppose, kind of head-on, one-to-one, -one theological challenge. So if the young, and they were predominantly young people back then, so if the young person seems to be espousing a particular version or a particular narrative that needed to be challenged, we, and partners, needed to find somebody who could have that head-on discussion about their ideology, uh, ideological beliefs. But again, pretty difficult stuff. It may have been simply removing them from whatever group was infecting them with the thinking that becoming a terrorist was a good idea. But again, in simple terms, that might be saying, actually, we're going to offer them anything from, I don't know, being very stereotypical, football training, um, youth club, um, extracurricular activity in terms of education, but something that draws them out of that group they are spending time with. And we were learning as we were going along. We really didn't know where this was going to go at the time. And of course what we'd then do is review how those, um, how those uh, interventions were going. And that was difficult. I can even remember having a conversation uh, with a lot of colleagues about actually, I mean, this is back then, do we tell the individual they are going to be subject to channel interventions? And some of you may think, oh, that's horrific. How can you not tell somebody what's, what's going to be happening to them by some kind of state partnership? Oh, that's terrible. But equally, we were saying, well, actually, 
we can we certainly can deliver interventions without them knowing the reality of why. So there'll be sometimes uh, and some ex uh, examples, for example, when actually a knock on the door by the local police officer to say, "Excuse me, mate, we think it's very unsafe in what you're up to, and we know what you're doing," and then probably walk off. Again. But there might be times to be more subtle than that. So somebody from the local football team might knock on the door and say, I tell you what, every Thursday and Friday night, we do football training. Do you want to join us? Because your mates, they, they play as well, so would you like to play? And they come and join as well, and they don't know they're subject to challenge. As it stands today, you have to tell people if they're going to be subject to challenge intervention. But back in the day, those conversations were being held because we didn't always know what the right and wrong thing was to do. Um, I suppose fast forward, one of my worries now, and say I'm retired now, and I'm out of this, um, but it is worrying because terrorism is certainly not going away. Um, I'm not going to go through each of those individually, but I suppose what do I know what works? So, spin it, I said, those are my worries, but what does work? I, I think my learning and the learning of the various units I've ended up would be that engagement works, and it's, it's as broad and simple as that. So, the, the more we can have conversations with people that are at risk, the better. Now that sounds very broad and very funny, pink and fluffy, that's an easy thing to do. Because in order to have conversations with the people that may become terrorists, we've got to identify them. So how do we identify them? And again, Prevent has got his critics saying, well, the health service shouldn't be spying on people, and the fire service shouldn't be spying on people when they go into people's homes. But the reality is, how do we, in this day and age, identify people? And that's the key question. So once we've identified them, we can have a conversation with them. But then who has that conversation? It's probably not always the case of the police. The police can be schizophrenic at times. One minute we want to be your best friends, and we put metaphorical arm around your shoulder and information to the life of the police. And you've got to tell us what's going on because we want to help. And then five minutes later, we're kicking your door in or kicking your neighbour's door in, and we're in right gear and doing all sorts of other things. So we're a little bit schizophrenic. So, if it's not a job for the police, it needs to be a job for partners. And if it's not a job for partners, well it is, but if you think it's not a job for the partners, where else do we go? And again, it seems to trust that, well, the communities can help in this. That's great if the communities have trust and confidence in people like the police and others to help. And there's a real, there's a real kind of um, honesty about this. So way back in the day, early days of Channel, if there was anything that was going to remind us that we needed to do something, it was the British police. I remember um, uh, somebody ringing up from one of the Yorkshire forces, and they ran through to my office, and they said, that we just, we just had a, uh, a woman in, uh, she's 40 odd, she's literally gone to the front counter of a police station in Yorkshire, and she's just said, I'm really worried about my son, he's left, he's left mine in his father's mosque, he, he's left the mosque, he's had a row with the imam, He's going somewhere else, he's not who he was, and frankly, I'm just really worried about him. And of course, the police officer on the front desk went, uh, I don't think I've got form for that. So they don't know what to do. So that, if, if there's any reality that says we need to do something to help that person and help the son, the daughter, or whatever else, that's the reality of where we're at at the moment. That's the space that we have to be in. Um, going back to the worries, I, I get all this kind of the, the partnership approach, and it's vital. And I get the communities, but if we don't have, I think number two, it's not in a, a, a list of importance, but if we don't have the trust and confidence of communities, of partners, but more importantly of individuals, we're not going to get anywhere. Many, many years ago, uh, some colleagues in the room will remember we had a commissioner at the time called Sir Ian Blair. I think he was the one that tried out the line that the police will not defeat terrorism. Full stop. National Problem is certainly colon. Um, communities will defeat terrorism. That line has not changed in the slightest, and it will always be the case. Because we're in a difficult position. We have to work with other people, and that's quite appropriate and quite right. Um, so there we go, all those things, synergies, that's a lovely word, isn't it? Why have we put synergies up there? It's because it's the, the synergy of all those partners buying into the same idea. So we heard before local authorities, they've had their budget slashed. The police have had their budget slashed in certain areas. Other things come up in terms of importance for both police, local authority, and the synergy of what do we do with counter-terrorism in terms of partnership work, I think that's going to get lost a little bit in the, in the, in the, in the changing. And I, can't, I do actually worry about that. Uh, most of the prevent work now, quite rightly, is led by local authorities. 
the police kind of took a backward step once we got a little bit of traction and we started bringing on local authorities. So we have taken a backward step in, in, kind of in, in, um, in delivering prevent, but we are clearly part of the non agency approach to deal with it. Um, I think that's about it actually. Desensitised, again, nice little trendy word. Uh, Desensitised because frankly we get used to Turkey, don't we? You know, what was it? Those that can remember many, many years ago, there was a bomb in the city of London, Canary Wharf, big explosion, bang, lots of things. That's really, really horrific. And every attack has been horrific. <coughs> the kind of, we, we do actually get desensitised to it, we get used to it. And that's not saying it's right, it's not condoning anything. But I think after a while we just kind of get, and so, well, I'll say it's probably a bit of a strong word, but we need to be on the front foot to counter terrorism because it affects all communities. And so I was just going back to, um, to my friend here, um, what we left, what we left about, sorry, the far right wing, did you mention the far right wing? The far right wing, again, early days in prevent, we had, again, up north, um, several forces telling us about young people that were displaying some really very unpleasant far right wing um, attitudes or approaches. And again, some of it scribbling on school books, some of it their activity in the playground. But again, it's just unhealthy, but we need to be known, does, is, is that going anywhere? What, what, what is influencing them to think and behave like that? Um, so that's about it from me. Theo, uh, as a journalist and author, and he's going to give us a, a keynote um, for the next five or ten minutes. Thank you, Pierre. Theo. First of all, thank you for inviting me, uh, Valerie, and thank you all for coming. And um, um, what I have for you today is a uh, like a preview. It's a um, yes, a sneak preview of a performance show thing that I would like to perform someday. Uh, it involves video and a script, and light cues and sound cues and music from the Quran, music from the jihad in Syria. I'm trying to like um, sort of remake a spiritual experience in the jihad on stage, um, which I will not do for you at the moment. However, I do have some, my, my talk is about spiritual experience uh, in the war in Syria right now. Like how do the, um, how do the fighters and the citizens of this place, how are they experiencing the violence um, it, that they are living through? And also, so I, I'm gonna speak from the first person because I lived through the violence myself. Anyway, I have some clips, I have a little bit of music, but I don't have like perfect technology here. In fact, my um, t technological assistant is Bettina, who um, I recruited like 10 minutes ago. So, <clears throat> so you'll have to bear with me as, uh, as I mess up the sound cues. Um, I would like to tell you about my voyage into the Syrian war. The reason why I want to speak about my own voyage right now, rather than say report on somebody else's, is because I think that the road um, that I took into Syria has been traveled, uh, I'm sorry, the road that I took into the war in Syria has been traveled um, by thousands of people, perhaps millions of people, by all those people whose lives have been jeopardized by this war. I'm speaking about the civilians and the fighters. I'm speaking about especially the young men who come from abroad to live and die on the path of God. Everybody, I think, has lived, has experienced this war in the same basic way. Here is, um, here is that story in three simple, quick sentences. An unsuspecting person, loving Syria but frightened by it, able to decipher the codes in this encrypted culture but not able enough, worried by the rising darkness on the horizon but not worried enough, sets forth through the olive groves. The storm descends and he is swept away. Um, I just want to play you a little bit of uh, music now because I think that people in Syria before the war w knew something was coming. I think in a way people wanted it to come. They didn't want this thing to come that did come, but they wanted something to come. Um, the song we're listening to now is a pop tune that you used to hear in the Damascus cabs, in the barber shops, in the restaurants. Uh, before the war, it was popular on the radio. It's by a band called Kulna So, which means all of us together. Um, it's a song about the catastrophe to come, the great sweeping away. Um, let's turn up the let's turn up the sound a little bit. I'll translate a few lyrics for you. Yeah, okay. Let's turn it down now. Thank you. Um, this song is called Safina Nur. It means the uh, Noah's Ark. 
the lyrics say, um, the lyrics say, when the storm comes, when the truth of things come, um, the, it, will, it will drown everybody. Everybody will leave. Um, but afterwards, when the reality comes, um, the sun will come up over our drowned houses, and there will be an ark, and it will rescue all of creation two by two. Like that. It's a really lovely, popular song in Damascus. You would have heard, no matter where you went before the war, in this mythical kind of cataclysm that people imagined, um, there's something pretty in a cataclysm. It comes from God, and it's good. Uh, there is a beauty to it, and there is a purpose. Uh, in this pop cult version of a cataclysm, um, its purpose is to wash away and to cleanse. Um, when the violence is done, the myth, like Syria is a very, um, it's, it's, it's a little bit like a big haunted house in that it's falling apart. And there has been a long standing popular wish, I believe, for the rot to wash away and something new and more powerful and good to come in its place because we know these Syrians are so lovely and good. And we just, we just feel that in our heart when you're there. They're so generous, they're so lovely, the religion is lovely, everything about one's experience there at least before the war, it was beautiful. It would break your heart to talk to these people sometimes. So I think that um, Syrians have wanted this side of Syria to come back. Um, anyway, in a proper, like, um, in a proper birth and uh, death and rebirth in religion, there is renewal, there is light, there is new life. Um, but this isn't necessarily the way it happens in real life. Um, about a year and a half into my imprisonment, I began to feel that the entire society around me had been swept away, and that it lived now within a sort of waking dream. Um, that dream was of oneness with the Quran. It was of radical equality among men, uh, not women, but men. Um, heroic death on the path of God, and invulnerability before the enemies of Islam. When had this dream taken control of the landscape? People then did not speak of dreams. How? But nobody asked these questions. Um, I wanted to take a, uh, a moment to look at where this violence has brought the believers in that place, namely uh, Syria, or in particular Aleppo. The clip I want to show you now is from a reporter's tour of eastern Aleppo in the summer of 2015. Hold on just one sec. Um, the neighborhood he's in here is called Ash'ar, which means the signal or the sign. Um, it was filmed in 2015. This neighborhood in which I was imprisoned, like in a basement, uh, I was imprisoned in the Department of Motor Vehicles in this neighborhood uh, that you will see in a sec. You, you, can show, um, you can show some of the video. Yeah, right here. That's enough. Hold on one sec. I, I, I want to translate a little bit before we get to it. Um, yeah, I was in prison in the, in, like, in the Department of Motor Vehicles here in this neighborhood. And so right, what, what I'm going to show you now is a reporter who's walking around the neighborhood just trying to get his finger on the pulse of the place. Like, what's going on in your minds, people? Um, so what, what, what this, guy, this guy is just a man on the street, right? And he, what he's saying is, um, he says, the only thing we have left to say is, that is, God is the best for us, and he shall dispose of our affairs. He says... He's looking around at all the catastrophe and ruins. He goes, everything here, one gets used to it. He says, I have three houses. By the favor of God, for the Allah, I built them and worked on them and in them. Can, let's listen just to that little bit here. He says, Allah Yaktubuna Hayaj Dida Bahada Deen. He is writing us a new religion a new a new life in this religion. Um, he goes on. He says, the difference between us, and th these people here in this neighborhood, and those people over there, is that when you are over there, he's pointing to the other side. This is like, the, it's a civil war, right? And, he, and he's in the eastern side. He's pointing to the west. He goes, those people over there, if you say, la ilaha illallah, if you say, um, there is no God but God over there, they kill you. Um, um, he says, by, by God, the glory of God, um, we'll never go back on this religion. We'll never turn our back on those words, there is no God but God. Um, even if this entire city crumbles, even if the entirety of Syria crumbles to the earth, to the, to the earth 
because these words, there is no God but God, are greater to me than the heavens, greater than Azam min zojti, he says, even greater than my wife and my children. Um, uh, the reason why I want to point this out is, I mean, I, my general feeling is that living in this war, it is it like, it's a radical experience. You cannot go through all these bombings, this violence, this death, the houses, the destruction. It's an apocalypse under, uh, right there, right now. And the, forget about the militants. The civilians are radicalized in this sense. Like this guy, he, he goes, all my worldly goods are gone, and I don't care. In fact, it's an honor for me. Now, we don't want this. Um, um, this is, this is why I, th I, I think it's important for us in the West to understand how people there are experiencing this war. And anybody who feels emotionally or spiritually connected to the victims of this war, how are they experiencing it? Um, I think if we knew this, we would, we would stop bombing them. Because we don't want the people um, who feel connected and who are themselves being bombed to turn away from the world of this life. Um, we don't want them to think of their neighbors in this way. Like, if you say la ilaha illallah, they'll kill you. It's not true. Um, I know it feels true for this guy. I know that people everywhere in Syria, um, and sometimes here too, by the way, they are acting as if it is true, as if, if you say la ilaha illallah, you'll either go to jail or, or, or they'll kill you. It's not true. Um, um, I think we all know that Peace will come when people feel that it's worth their while to invest and build and take care of their families. We know this. Um, in, in which case, we should ask, why on earth are we bombing them? Um, okay, about my sense of living in a world that had been swept away. I think now there was more design and calculation to this sweeping away than I was aware of then. And that these spiritual authorities in Syria meant to inflict a particular kind of progress of the spirit on me, on all of my fellow prisoners, and the citizens, the normal everyday citizens, and on their own fighters. We all went through the same process. I think it was a deliberate process, kind of like semi-designed by the big sheikhs in Syria. This, it was like a voyage, it was a spiritual progress. It followed an archetype. The saga begins as similar Christian myths do in a city of destruction. It doesn't have to be physical destruction. It can be moral destruction, and it often is. Um, a call. That's the first chapter. It begins there. Then the first chapter, a call, summons the believer to a voyage of discovery. This kind of happened with me when I said, I'm going to go off into Syria and like, understand why they're killing each other. Um, so he leaves his family behind. He soon finds himself in a world heavy with meanings and portents. He is tested here. This happens to all the little kids, uh, little kids, the young men, the Mujahideen, the young kids from England and France and Holland that go off there tested. First they have to like decipher and scrutinize and make sense of the surroundings. Study the Quran and they are tested. They come very close to death. Um, um, over the course of their voyage, they pass these tests, and they are rewarded with greater physical powers. And by the way, greater moral discernment. Then led onward in the company of teachers and comrades to face their destiny. This is what the young men are after. Uh, though I never converted to Islam in any official sense, I think now that the spiritual authorities in, in Aleppo sent me on the Islamic version of this voyage, as they do to basically all the people that they control. They do it by bringing those under their power to the very edge of life, like this guy here, um, just a civilian, um, then a little bit beyond, so that you aren't quite attached to the world of this life anymore. And then they force a regime of bitterness without end onto their victims. Um, I, I, got, I was like the luckiest of all the prisoners in Syria. All the other prisoners, like most of them died. They were shot in the head. Um, uh, you know, the ones that survived, they, they got, they, they um, were beaten and electrocuted and just drowned and starved much worse than I was. So I was like the lucky one. Um, living out there in that dark place, you hear the Quran. Um, and you begin to reckon with all the blessings that you had earlier in life. Um, why did you never attend to them, you think? The ships that move in the ocean, the pearls, the coral, the salt water, and the fresh. Um, 
the message of the Quran is that you should attend to these miracles that, uh, that surround us now. Like the miracles are surrounding us now and we should attend to them now. <clears throat> um, when you are living in a physical and moral darkness, as I was in the, ba the basement in that neighborhood, a Sha'ar, um, when you feel you might die in the evening, you will attend to those miracles. You will do anything. Um, maybe nothing is being asked of you. That's fine, you will wait. Uh, when something good happens to you um, in that darkness, it could be just like a person reaches out and touches you. Um, you will be struck dumb. The sound of the rain showers and the branches outside your window will bring you to tears, especially if you happen to be listening to that rain in a room full of people who think they soon will also die. Um, this is the condition of so many of the fighters. They're quite prepared to die. They come there and they get more prepared because the bombing is everywhere all the time. People are dying all the time. It's the position of the prisoners because we were under the impression we were going to be killed. And the regime fighters too, you know, they're also dying. And, and by the way, the regime civilians are also dying. It's a civil war. I mean, mass casualties. Over time, a person in such a situation will turn his thoughts to miracles. Like, I'm a secular person, but this happened to me. At least it happened this way to me. I had given up on the conventional kinds of rescues. Um, was I ready to give up on the, like, I, I was like, nobody will ever find me in this basement. And even if they wanted to, they, it turned out to be true, by the way. They knew, CIA probably knew where I was, but they weren't going to rescue me, fine. I gave up on them. Um, when you've been in that dark place long enough, there will be part of you that feels that the men who've lately been pushing their boots into the back of your neck so that your face grinds into the pavement and blood streams from your nose might actually be made to forgive you. Um, how miraculous would that be? It's unbelievable, but in your imagination, you think it's possible. If they did forgive, your time of helplessness and isolation would be over. They take many people into their circle of affection. Why not you? If they did this, their power, which is everywhere in that place, it's the power of the powerful men with the guns and the long beards and the Quran, Kalashnikov, if they forgave you and took you into their circle of affection, their power would be your power. And this is what, like I'm, try, I'm describing here a spiritual experience that you have in prison. But I think, I think in a way, all the, all the other prisoners had it, the fighters have it, the citizens themselves have it. It's like the war is so violent, so all-encompassing, you cannot get away from it. If you're there long enough, you will go through this voyage, and it will be like shaped and formed um, either by the regime, if you live with them and believe in them, or by the other regime, you know, in the other side of things, the rebels. Thank you all for listening. Uh, I, I mean, it's, I, I'm just lost for words to you, I'm not really um, used to that kind of feeling. Um, because a lot, a lot of what you've been through, some of what you've been through, I, I can relate to that. I've seen that happen. But I don't think the audience had an opportunity to sort of be exposed to somebody like you and, and to listen to that. Uh, and we're going to talk about disengagement, rehabilitation, reintegration of extremists and foreign fighters. Is it possible or not? Uh, what are the opportunities versus the challenges? We know that a lot of countries uh, like Theo just said, that you know, the US and some other countries don't even consider you know, rehabilitation or de-radicalization <clears throat> or prevention even. And some do. And the ones that do, uh, I've got uh, some lines to say that um, let's not waste too much resource on them. Or once a person has gone to a certain extreme, there's no turning them back. Or whilst they're out in Syria, uh, it's better to kill them rather than to waste money on them coming back and then putting them through the criminal justice system. Let's have a, let's have a discussion about this today. Um, so my first speaker on this is going to be um, Dr. Badras uh, Shole uh, from, from Jakarta, please. Uh, this is uh, among my experience for more than uh, 10 years uh, engaged with uh, former terrorists in Indonesia uh, who they become an actors of uh, disengagement. Uh, prevention and also content terrorism and uh, it's I think although probably the context for uh, UK probably not directly but uh, it's important for us to learn what happened in Southeast Asia uh, compared to uh, Europe and, and Middle East because uh, ISIS after Syrian 
uh, defeat. I think uh, the uh, low many fronts, including in the Philippines, Southern Philippines, Abu Sayyaf group is become now becoming a front in Southeast Asia and uh, many uh, foreign fighters, including from Australia, they uh, refuse to visit, to return to Australia and then they choose to stay longer in Southeast Asia, join fighting, including uh, fighters from uh, Uyghur from uh, China. They also join fighting in Indonesia and, and the Philippines as well. Why well, it's important because uh, there is a process of disengagement, rehabilitation and also uh, reintegration. And, and the process uh, is not short term, it takes long term process. It's, uh, but I will begin with uh, what happened in, in Southeast Asia, why they joined uh, fighting and probably uh, we have almost similar to Bosnia in, in conflict area, why people join uh, terrorists because there is conflicts and conflicts is always uh, uh, important uh, reason for them to join fighting, to join jihad, including in, in Afghan war in 1980s. Uh, so is Asia have long history in during uh, after uh, in, after independence or after colonial period. I think uh, we are divided into some uh, groups, nationalists and Islamists, found their own platform of called Islamic State in 1950s. In 1949, it was Islamic State in Indonesia and and they have idea to establish Islamic State in Southeast Asia in 1950s. So they established in 1980s, they hijacked uh, Garuda Indonesia uh, Airways. And in 1982, it started a war against Soviet Union in, in Afghanistan. I think Sad Hanif, yes, yeah. We have uh, experience and, and it's, it's important for us to understand conflicts in Afghanistan. It's also influence in Southeast Asia as well. 1992 founded uh, Jamaa Islamia, uh, Al-Qaeda networks in Southeast Asia. And it's among the most influential uh, terrorist organization in Southeast Asia, uh, founded by uh, Abu Ghraib Ashir and uh, Abdullah Sunkar, two uh, teachers uh, from Indonesia. And most intellectual jihadis in Southeast Asia, most of them come from Indonesia. Not only uh, they uh, sp uh, develop uh, some uh, schools in Malaysia, also in the Philippines, but also they produce uh, many books and export in, in Southeast Asia. So that's how jihad include intellectualism, I call it jihadist Violent jihadist intellectualism also growing uh, quite well in Southeast Asia. It's not, not quite, not, it's very different from, from Europe and including from Middle East, I think. So, and then the, uh, the establishment of uh, ISIS in, 19, in, in 2014, uh, people who disagree with this engagement of Al Qaeda network of, of Jama Islamia, they f support. Uh, well, Al-Baghdadi in, in 2014. And then there is uh, the latest operation was in uh, 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 some, some numerous in 2000, 2016, it was uh, attack in Jakarta, also in Marawi in uh, uh, Southern Philippines, is the, uh, the latest uh, uh, operations by uh, ISIS in Southeast Asia. But I will consider it's important for us to understand that uh, CVE, we should include the impact of uh, terrorism operations, not only in, in Europe, but also in other, other countries that we arrest, let's say in Indonesia, we arrest uh, uh, 1,400 people already uh, for, since, since 2001. And we release uh, more than 800 uh, terrorists already. But few of them, they, they, uh, they still join again and again another 
uh, jihad or uh, terrorist operations. And that's influenced strongly by their uh, this, uh, disappointment to government, including to civil society. But we will, I will discuss more about that one. Uh, this, uh, this is the argument from John, Hor John Horgan, it's uh, popular of uh, his books of, of uh, psychology of uh, terrorism. That's uh, this engagement of uh, terrorists is not only using one approach, it's a multi approach. It could be very individual, it could be family, it could be mother. Uh, I have a per personal experience when I talk to uh, terrorist prisoners in, 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 uh, in Indonesia. I asked him why are you why you disengage from from your terrorist uh, uh, groups? It's because of my mother. My mom asked me, "If you still love me, you must leave your group." And then he totally disengaged from uh, violent uh, jihadists, and now he helped government a lot. But he he he, uh, he lived in he has uh, he was in prison, life in prison, so. So when I visit him, he, he consider me as as a important source because many of them they transform themselves not because of a preaching, not because of a ideology, but because of a family. Could be wife, could be children, could be a mother of or, or mother. So like uh, like this one, Ian is a. Uh, Arifuddin Lako, his name, he, he was uh, 10 years in prison and then he transformed himself because of his mom as well. Mm. He, he, uh, he asked his mom whether I should uh, go to, I should uh, uh, surrender because of he, was, he was on leave uh, for five years. And then his mom, you must come to police station. Mm. And then he visited police station he cooperate now. He become important uh, actor in Indonesia. He said that to disengage, we need engagement to uh, multi ethnic and multi religious uh, community. And he become a leader, uh, community leader in Eastern Indonesia. In Poso, Poso was uh, having uh, Muslim and Christian conflict. Uh, more than 5,000 people killed during three years of conflict in, in Eastern Indonesia. And now he uh, asked another uh, Christian, young Christian uh, to join his group and he developed his, he, uh, I asked him uh, that he transformed, he developed, uh, he called it a Comunitas Rumakatu, so it's a, a Rumakatu community, it's called it. He, because he realized that without engagement to multi-ethnic and multi-religious group, it's important to uh, keep a permanent peace in, in Poso. And, and that's, that's uh, related to uh, how UK, uh, based on the, uh, Dr. Joe's uh, research, is important for, for us to uh, engage more multi-ethnic and multi-religious group to uh, prevent hatred, to prevent uh, curiosity among among society, and and in exactly uh, have his own experience for engaging people. It's part of among the best strategy for this engagement. So uh, there are about four strategies in Indonesia for how people disengage or reintegrations. One one is that. It's important for us to include former terrorists or former activists to be the main actors. It is them who understand to prevent and counter terrorism. And, and of course, it uh, takes a long process. Uh, in Indonesia, we have uh, arrested 1,400 people, but uh, I, I calculate this about not more than 20 people of them, they join leadership for counterterrorism. So, so it's, it's hard even to invite them as well. But they uh, become leader voluntarily, and that's, that's the best thing for Indonesia, that uh, uh, 
supporting uh, main actor from former terrorists. Partnership among state and civil societies is among very important aspects. I think uh, also in, in uh, many countries, not only in Southeast Asia, including in Europe, security is uh, a state, state, state actor. In, in realism, uh, state is the main actor of security. But for terrorism, uh, it should include state and civil society. State could not uh, manage uh, CVE them by themselves. It needs a civil society as well. And also, uh, another is a economic program that's uh, so working very well. Uh, there are some programs run by former terrorists uh, on, on economic skills programs. And it's, it's important for, for them to invite another former terrorist as well to join. The most important uh, challenge for, uh, for Indonesia is that because uh, Indonesia is, is one of the uh, middle power countries in, in Asia. Uh, we compete on our democracy with, with uh, extremists. Uh, right wing uh, or Islamist parties, they, in, they try to politicize some issues, including sporting uh, jihadists in in uh, in, the, in their ways, and that's uh, com I call it competing in in democratic uh, uh, area. Also, uh, uh, there is a decentralization pro uh, program in Indonesia. A local government in Indonesia uh, still uh, they don't aware that 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 uh, CVE is among their their uh, responsibility, and that's. That's how, uh, when uh, we can consider that uh, government is not central government, Indonesian uh, central government is the most, the most responsible in, in CVE. But uh, uh, early this year, about May 2018, there will be uh, agreement that 32 ministries and uh, state uh, institutions will be among uh, uh, government institutions who are responsible in, in CFE program. So coordination among them are important to be to make a comprehensive uh, policy on, on counter-terrorism, including rehabilitation and, and reintegration. Uh, finally, that's uh, uh, in conclusion, that's yes, uh, this engagement, rehabilitation and reintegration needs long-term program. It's not, it's not a short term. It's uh, important for affiliations and partnership among all groups, including uh, Muslim Christians, all religions, and, and ethnic groups, and and it's 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 a must of of the policy. Thank you so much. Uh, if I could ask Mohammed Dosif to to come on from the Grafton College and the C S R C C R. Uh, well, I am here to present the perspective uh, from Pakistan. Uh, before I uh, start the perspective on Pakistan, I just want to share an incident uh, just to see or just to uh, you know, uh, tell you about the severity of the events or of the incidents. Uh, it was 2007, 24th of November, uh, when the suicide bombers, they attacked, for the first time they launched an attack on, the, on a Supreme Security Agency in Pakistan in, in Rawalpindi. And 28 agents in one attack uh, they got killed. Now, following that attack on 24th of uh, November 2007, so the agency along with the military and paramilitary, they launched a nationwide hunt. And as a result, uh, obviously many people, many people who were the key perpetrators of the incidents, uh, they were arrested. Among the ones who were arrested, there was a guy called as Mullah Ali. Uh, Mullah Ali obviously is his fake name, not his real name. Uh, the guy was very famous in Afghanistan and Pakistan because he was capable of converting uh, young people into suicide bombers. And his uh, CV was outstanding in front of the agencies because he has converted around 500 uh, youngsters into suicide bombers in just one year. So which was outstanding uh, to secure any kind of a job for him. Uh, when he was uh, captured by Section 21, he was kept in Rabal Pindi uh, in a high security prison. So I had a chance with some of my colleagues to go and meet him in that prison. So. Uh, the, the main question among all other questions that we asked from that, that person, my, my, my question was that how is it possible? 
what is your capability what is your core ideology through which you were able to uh, radicalize 500 young people in one year and and he came up with a straight answer he said that it's not my capability is to your capability and uh, i know uh, who you guys are and uh, Basically, you guys kill our women, you guys kill our men, you guys kill our children, you guys bomb our houses in different parts of Afghanistan and Pakistan, so that makes our job very, very easy. So we don't have to de-radicalize anybody by selling them necessarily any ideology. So obviously, uh, we were amazed at, at the, the stance that he took and then he came up with a very amazing uh, offer for me. And uh, the, the guy asked me that uh, I can turn any Muslim, whether good or bad, into a suicide bomber within 30 minutes, within 30 minutes. So, and then he said that if you allow me and if you want to have a sitting with me for 30 minutes, so I can assure you that I can transform you into a suicide bomber as well. So, it was funny, uh, we were six of, uh, it was six of us at that point right there. Obviously, I did not accept his offer. I didn't want my CV to highlight anything which I don't want to. But, but that was the magnitude, that was the ideology that was the fanatic beliefs that uh, Pakistan has been up against along, among with the rest of the world. But obviously, I'll stick my speech uh, to Pakistan today. So, on this note, uh, just to share some statistics, the latest 22nd of April, 63,138 people have been killed uh, in, in Pakistan. They have become a victim of uh, terrorism. And we have lost at least 6,500 colleagues. Uh, who have been working for different military, paramilitary and different agencies uh, in, this, in this entire stream. And we have lost a lot of economy in that. 123.1 billion US dollars is 9-11, according to the recent economic survey in, in Pakistan. All right. Uh, this is what we used to think when I was in Pakistan before 2009, that once a terrorist, always a, always a terrorist, but, but not quite so. Now, our thinking has changed quite a lot in Pakistan. How has that changed? Before jumping on to that, I want to discuss some of the causes of radicalization, why people got radicalized in Pakistan. Low social economic status, obviously in Fata and uh, the areas near the Afghan border, especially in Balochistan, some of the areas were very, very poorly managed by the, by the central government. Uh, then large and broken family structures, history of physical abuse as a child. There have been many cases that we have come across during our studies and research and work in Pakistan. Strict and negligent behavior of parents and teachers, again, uh, lack of a formal and informal education, this has been the biggest problem in Pakistan, especially those people, those children who become victims to suicide bombing. The biggest, the one thing that they have in common is poverty, poor background, and second thing is lack of formal education. Uh, lack of critical thinking, emotional instability, yes, anxiety disorder, inferiority complex, revenge and authority seeking behavior. Some of our colleagues, especially uh, Mr. Hanif has been uh, saying this this morning that yes, revenge. When people think that they are being killed for, for nothing, their families are being killed uh, for nothing. And that's why it is a, basically they want to take a revenge by becoming suicide bombers and beca by becoming extremists. Now, uh, another small incident I would like to share at this point. After the Osama's operation, OBL's, uh, Osama bin Laden, we call him OBL in our circles, when he was killed uh, in Habitabad in 2011. So I visited Pakistan after that. Well, I was in UK in the, at that time. So I visited Habitabad and um, I was doing a research, I was writing an article uh, for a paramilitary organization on, on the Osama bin Laden operation. So uh, that took me to one terrorist commander and he was in, again in a high security prison in Abbottabad. So uh, when I was taking his interview and uh, I was talking to him, so I again asked him the best selling point. What is your best selling point? So he said that uh, drone attacks, it's as simple as that. And obviously this is how he explained the, the, the guy. He said that when I go out in villages or in far-flung areas in order to preach people to become terrorists or to become suicide bombers, so I gather 90 people whenever I preach for six months. This is a formula that he shared, that whenever he preached for six months, he get at least 90 followers on his side. And then he said, but when you guys, uh, you know, do a drone attack, so I get that much people in one day without doing anything. Wow. Well, uh, this is his perspective and this, his perspective has been proven uh, in the last many years in, in Pakistan. Sylvan Magnolia, which is the name of the drone uh, program uh, run by CIA, it has done much damage to the US reputation as well, along, as, along with killing uh, innocent people and some high value targets as well. Uh, well, uh, to talk about rehabilitation and reintegration programs, 
they have been uh, uh, you know in process since 1940s but pre 911 programs they included greece malaysia kenya egypt and pro mostly the programs of rehabilitation they emerged after 911 so today we are going to discuss some of the programs in pakistan i am skipping uh, sri lanka and other slides okay when we talk about pakistan so this is a gentleman lieutenant general asif yasin malik this gentleman has been a core commander uh, a corps commander in peshawar uh, during the osama operation and he is the guy who is the initiator of rehabilitation pakistan uh, program in pakistan in the valley of sawad the first program of rehabilitation was launched in 2009 by pakistan army and it was supervised by uh, lieutenant general asif yasin malik he has been my boss and my mentor for for very many, many years in pakistan now uh, the name of the most famous programs are mishal and sabaun who were directly engineered by lieutenant general asif yasin malik now basically there was a uh, terror take, a terrorist taken in the area in swat valley pakistan army they went there in that area and intelligence agencies they got the area uh, back under their control and in that area they built up mishal training center in the in mishal training center pakistan military basically categorizes the terrorists in three categories what are those three categories the first category is jet black jet black are those people obviously who have killed other people then we have black and then we have gray categories which are usually moderate level of extremists or terrorists uh, in those in that institution the pakistan military provides vocational training skills they open workshops for them and then pakistan army has also launched the pakistan institute of technical education which is again uh, teaching the terrorists some of the other reintegration programs that in a, that, that have taken in the place in pakistan are mishal sabaun parley rastum faitum and hela these are the all the programs which, have, which are in process in Pakistan at the moment. Uh, what they do? Corrective religious education, vocational training, counseling and therapy and a discussion module that discusses social issues and includes sessions with the students, families. Now this is something which distinguishes uh, military's program with other uh, de-radicalization programs which are launched by the government in Punjab. I'm going to shed some light on them shortly. Well, Mishal is the de-radicalization and emancipation program, DREP, which was launched in 2009, as I've said. Now, according to uh, our sources, uh, nearly 2,500 extremists, they have been put into that pilot program by Pakistan Army in Swat. And 99% uh, success rate is something which Pakistan military sources they are uh, claiming. And uh, basically they follow a no blood and hand policy in that institution. For example, if they find any extremist or any terrorist who has killed any innocent, so they are not put into that program. They are kept separate and they are given some different treatment under some other programs. All right, what are the objectives of this reintegration or rehabilitation program? This is how Pakistan military defines objectives. Achieving long-term peace and stability in the Swat Valley and obviously across the country now. Minimizing the workload of formal judicial system, reducing the possibility of exploitation and radicalization. Displaying a caring face of the state in general. Communicating a moderate ideology of Islam. So this is, these are some of the objectives, if not all, of this de-radicalization program which is being governed by Pakistan military. Uh, Lieutenant General Hamid Khan, another uh, big figure who is behind this Mishal uh, program. So we had done some work with Mishal through Lieutenant General uh, Hamid Khan sir. So this program is basically for teenage militants, for young offenders in Pakistan. And in the first batch, which was started in 2009, only 11 out of 152 were ready for integration, so which is a very very poor success rate but obviously keeping in view it was the first program so that was something that military still cherishes that at least 11 people were ready to uh, integrate basic concept is to provide comparative education to terrorists in those compounds those terrorists or extremists or the students uh, uh, for argument's sake they are, they are kept 24 hours in their compounds under strict surveillance the entire vocational training institute is heavily guarded by uh, pakistan military and pakistan police officials People are trained with psychologists, teachers and religious instructors and then at the end they go through what we all know very well, polygraph test, just to see whether they are back on track or, or, or not. So Pakistan learned from mistakes made by Saudi Arabia. In Saudi Arabia basically there was less family integration into their rehabilitation program and five or some people they went back uh, to join uh, Al-Qaeda in Yemen and they became big leaders in Al-Qaeda. So in Pakistan now they are involving more and more families in the reintegration or rehabilitation process uh, in Sawat. Moving on, um, Sabaun and Mishal, these are the vocational schools for militants and so come so, they have, uh, the Pakistan army has put proper IT, proper electronic classes in those classrooms and in, in that institution. And they are providing proper engineering education even to the extremists 
in that area. The focus on the center is not specifically about jihad, instead it is about, it is about skills. The, so the main focus of military is to give entrepreneurial skills, to teach uh, technical skills to all those extremists, to all those militants, to all those terrorists. And once they get those skills, Pakistan army not just teaches them those skills, but they provide them funds as well. And uh, I have met some people, especially Akram, I've just mentioned his name. Again, Akram is not his real name. So uh, he was a pre-engineering student. He was been through the program for two years. The minimum probation is six months, maximum one year, but he was there for two years. And after the completion of two years program, Pakistan Army opened a uh, automotive workshop for him. And now basically he runs that workshop near uh, Savatwari. So this is the kind of work that those people, they are uh, doing. But all this work is strictly supervised by military in Pakistan without any direct government involvement or civil society, which is a drawback as well. Uh, moving forward, Lameer Jinn Asim Malik, again, he's our, uh, sir. One minute. Take a minute. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. I'll just move on. The results, just to discuss the results, since 2010, several thousand young men and a handful of women have graduated from the program. The funding from Mishal Sabon and a couple of other rehab centers in Swat comes from Pakistan Army and from international aid groups as well. Some of the lessons that we can learn from these programs. Theological re-education is unlikely to prevent radicalization. We have to put effects of culture and society as well in these programs. The rehabilitation process needs to take account of social and cultural dynamics. Active participation of families and communities is important. Programs must be professional, flexible. They must be nationwide. At the moment, the focus is in Sawat and uh, in, in, in WFP. It should be a nationwide program. And then, uh, unfortunately, the focus has been on the low tier of extremists in, in Pakistan. The focus must be on top tier of extremists as well. Because in Pakistan, the people, the, the extremists or the young offenders, they follow the top tier of extremists. Mostly the program is state controlled and centralized and it is led by army, which should not be the case. The civil society, the government, the educationists, the scholars, everybody must be involved in teaching and education. The extremists, extra focus on religious education, lack of transparency, military chooses to bring its own religious scholar. This is a big problem. Military must not do that. And we have written a report for them. Let's see how they are going to uh, react to that. Lack of financial resources, especially in Punjab, must not one size fit for all approach must be followed. Uh, drone attacks, I've already discussed that. Pakistani prisons, yes. In Pakistani prisons, they are the main drivers of radicalization. I myself have visited quite a few prisons uh, and met with some uh, terrorists over there. So they have got the facility of mobile phone. They can contact each and every one whenever they want to. So this lack of poor facilities and poor security, it is doing drastic damage to the work which is done by Pakistan Army. On the other hand, uh, the last slide, there are certain benefits of program as well. Obviously, de-radicalized programs, they assist directly in uh, countering the terrorist groups. Uh, for example, Asan Ullah Asan, I'm not sure whether you heard the name as well. Uh, Tariqa Talwan Pakistan, he was the top operator of Tariqa Talwan Pakistan. Last year, he was uh, arrested by Pakistan military by Section 21. And now he's in the custody, but he works with Pakistan military. And he has exposed uh, many high roads, including uh, the high road of Mullah Fazlullah, which is supposed to be in, uh, in, 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 in Afghanistan. Prevents recruitment of new generation, promote local communities, provide skills and education to young uh, offenders. So Pakistan's effort to date have essentially concentrated on low-risk militants, foot soldiers, or low-level facilitators. Well, the steps must be taken to rehabilitate high-risk militants as they influence their uh, followers. So I'll complete uh, my discussion on this point. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Can I ask you to please present your uh, understanding and experience on, on rehabilitation? Thank you very much. I'm going to speak about uh, my experience of rehabilitating prisoners in the UK, um, why we need to rehabilitate, um, what we need in place to rehabilitate those individuals, how do we know what we're going to do with them, give you some case studies, and then reverse it a bit and leave you with some questions maybe, just to deflect off me. Um, 2008, I was asked to set up Central Extremism Unit in the National Offender Management Service in London. Um, I operationally managed it for eight years after that, so I was responsible for managing up to 170 convicted terrorists in London, in prison and coming out of prison. And then later, um, over 400 people of concern, so where there were concerns about them being radicalized in prison, uh, and later on in the community when I uh, moved in to prevent. Um, so when I talk about uh, and give you evidence of what I'm talking about, this is where I've gleaned this evidence from. It's from first-hand experience of talking to terrorists. So, 
Why do we need to rehabilitate? What is the, you know, what is the problem with not sticking them in prison, shooting them, droning them, whatever we need to do? So prison works. There's no doubt that if you put somebody in prison, they're not committing crime. Unfortunately, even the suicide bombers for 21-7 who got 40 years, uh, Hussein Osman will be released before he's 70. So these people will come out of prison at some point. So if your only um, risk management is about putting them in prison, um, it's not going to work because they will come out of prison. So you need to have conversations. Even somebody like Hussein Osman had 40 years in prison. Three times a year, every year, myself and my probation officer went to visit him, went to have a conversation with him to start the process of allowing him to rehabilitate himself. You can't rehabilitate somebody. You have to just give them, I believe, the room to rehabilitate. So what do we do? Why do we do it? It's about humanity. We talk about human rights, we talk about humanity, we talk about being a caring state, we care about the government, the government cares about us. We should give people room to change. People make mistakes. When people are groomed into this, it's about an abusive relationship. They're tricked, they're sold a deviant political uh, discourse, a deviant religious discourse. They believe it, they think they're doing the right thing. So we, again, you know, humanity should give them the opportunity to change, to right the wrong that they've done. Um, as I said, long-term security doesn't work, so we need to build on that, um, what's happened to them and the fact they've gone into prison, start to build on that for when they come out to be released. So what needs to be in place? So we need room to initiate change. I don't mean a place where they can go and take off their shirt, but I mean space, a place where they feel not judged, where they feel that they can say what they want, where they can ask questions. I remember talking to uh, some guys who had been suicide bombers on the uh, liquid bomber plot, and they said that they wanted to talk about the Islamic uh, reasoning for being a suicide bomber, but they had nowhere to talk about it. If they tried to bring it up in a mosque, everybody shushed them and said, the MI5 are listening, you can't do that. If they tried to talk to their friends about it, they didn't want to know. So actually, we provided a space where they could go, somewhere like ACF, somewhere where they could go and ask those questions and not feel that people were judging them and not feel worried that they were asking those questions. There has to be an element of security. Uh, the police used to call it the Daily Mail check. If things went wrong and your name, was my name, went on the front page of the Daily Mail because there was a mistake, how would I feel about that? That's not a great way to look at risk management, but actually it's quite a practical way to make you think about things. You need to be, able to, you need to be providing security. You need to make sure that the individual is uh, monitored. That's either with electronic tagging, where we're looking at his phone, looking at his computer, where we're stopping him going to certain places, stopping him meeting certain people. Um, we need to think about um, what sort of multi-agency approach we get. Do we need to involve the police in seeing him? How will he react to a police officer coming and talking to him? Will he be okay with a probation officer? What is the legitimacy of that discourse? You know, um, I worked in Saudi Arabia for a long time. I have a good knowledge of Islam, but the best will in the world, I'm white, middle class maybe, I'm old, I'm from the government. I can't go and talk to a young man from Lambeth about his religion without him just sneering at me. So again, it's about using people such as Hanif, the sort of community groups to broker these conversations. Um, it's about making sure there's a support network in place as well. And again, we'll talk about this quite a few times, about social capital, about having a relationship, about having family, but also about people like probation officers, mentors, this can be prison officers, police officers, anybody that they trust who they wouldn't normally interact with. A lot of this is about them and us, and it's breaking down those them and us barriers. So it's about having a long-term plan. It's about building social capital. In uh, criminology, they call it the desistance model. So as time goes on, as people get married, have children, get a good job, get houses, you get more things in the good part of your, your set of scales, you're less likely to be involved in crime or in terrorism because you have more to lose. It's quite a simple thing. Um, identity is a massive issue. I would say of all of the terrorists I work with, 99.9% .9 had an issue about identity. Talk about that. Um, so that's why, that's how. So, sorry, that's what we need in place. So how, how do we disengage? How do we know what to do with these individuals? The professor talked about going there and talking to them about disengagement. We went there and talked to them about engagement. So we talked to them, how did they get involved in extremism? We listened to endless reams of paperwork generated by the police, by the security service, where there were cameras, where there were probes, where they were listening. 
we'd look at court uh, testimonies, we'd talk to their parents, their friends, perhaps gathering these huge amounts of information about an individual to find out why they were hooked into extremism. And again, I would say 106, 170 or so terrorist offenders, only two that said religion pulled them into it. Most of the others, it's a mixture of things, and actually religion didn't play much of a part. They were very, they didn't know much about religion, or their idea of religion was mixed with politics. Um, so again, it's about finding what drove them. We found, Hanif has mentioned this lots of times, that grievance was one of those biggest issues, that they had a, um, a fixation on Palestine, or they had a fixation on the, the state of Israel, they had a fixation on what was going in Bosnia, um, Chechnya, places like this. Um, they also, a lot of them, particularly young men, not so much the young ladies that we met, the young men believe in conspiracy theories. So lots of conversation about the Illuminati, who may or may not exist, I don't know, I don't think they do, but you know, lots of discussion about that. So they're listening to Al Jazeera or Russian network TV or getting stuff off, offline. So they're not watching Sky, um, Fox, or any of these are BBC or any other sort of balanced media that we have. Um, they have very anti-authority attitudes, and that can be just on a basis they hate the police, can be that they hate local government, can be they hate government, they hate the Western government, and it builds on up. But again, it's that basic idea that they don't trust authority whatsoever. They believe in instrumental violence. They use violence. These are quite often people from gangs, from uh, quite violent areas anyway, so they're quite happy to use violence to make a point. It comes naturally almost to them. Very much about us and them, the in and out group, and it's when you begin to dehumanize the out group, it becomes dangerous. When you begin to think that that out group has no value of, as people, as humans, things like that. So this, the us and them is a very strong thing. Um, use of violence to dominate, or the threat of violence to dominate. Again, Daesh, very good at instrumental violence, but also using that threat to dominate. So by doing these killings live online, when they move to new areas, people will give in almost straight away because they don't want to be beheaded, they don't want to be, you know, immolified, these sorts of things. Um, concrete thinking. Again, we had, we were talking earlier about this uh, really concrete thinking, critical thinking. So concrete thinking, this sort of one-dimensional way of looking at things. Sensation seeking. Um, I use myself here as an example. I was, and it's, it's hard to believe because I look so young, but I joined the military in the 70s uh, when everything was black and white. Um, and I knew I would go to Northern Ireland. And I looked forward to it. I thought it was quite exciting to go to Northern Ireland, get a big gun and a helmet and wander down the street. Everybody think I was dead cool. It was exciting until somebody shot at me. Then it's not exciting anymore. But there is something about that. Particularly young men want to go abroad, want to go and fight. They want to go to the exotic places. Um, so sensation seeking, and again, economics. Uh, the doctor earlier talked about being paid. People get money, you know. Simple economics sometimes will drive these things. Survivalist issues, particularly white supremacists use this idea that if we don't stop the hordes coming in from other countries here, our way of life will be eroded forever. And by our way of life, they mean that sort of white tattooed skinhead with a beer belly who hollers at the TV at the weekend at football. Those types of things are so very much an issue of my culture is dying. Um, and then this idea of identity. The identity is very one-dimensional. You know, my identity is about my religion. My identity is about my colour, where we see it as really a very fluid thing. You know, I have a different identity when I'm at home to my friends. Um, I have a very different online, maybe, persona. I'm very professional, so identity can be very different. Um, and also about using some of the identity to break down communities. So this, at the, at the very base of all extremism, terrorism, it's about dividing people. And they're very clever at the way they use colour, they use religion, they use these sorts of things to divide uh, colour. So moving on then, uh, just um, a few case studies then to talk about. So when I worked in the Central uh, Extremism Unit, we had to develop ways of working with uh, offenders and extremists because previously probation prisons, we steered away from talking about politics and religion because frankly it was a real minefield. People only talked about religion when generally sex offenders said they'd found God and therefore they were never going to offend again so they were safe. And it was almost that sort of, you know, everything is okay because I've found God. So we had to look at ways of trying to talk about religion but then found out we didn't talk about religion. We talked about everything but religion because actually religion wasn't the big driver. We talked about programs uh, such as the Healthy Identity Program, um, which looks at how you can build a healthy identity, how you can change yourself. Looks at using critical thinking, looks at different skills you can use to identify yourself. Um, using education, sometimes theology, and really using theology as a safety 
process. Most of the people that we worked with, and Hannah, if I'm sure, will back this up, and, and Mohammed probably, don't know much about the religion. Most religions at the very base are moralistic, are safe, and are good things. So if you can get somebody to practice a religion in, you know, in a purposeful way, then that's a good thing. Um, let's say we use education. Um, and we look at ways of breaking the cycles. I talked earlier about tagging people and surveillance in them. Quite often this will break them away from networks where they will have a legitimate reason to say, I can't come to the meeting, I can't come and see you anymore, guys, because the police are watching me, because I've got a tag on. And again, it gives them permission to say no. And a lot of the young people we met, in, particularly in networks, were in there because they'd been bullied into it, because they'd been pulled into it, and they were threatened that if they left, it would hurt them. So actually, by us sticking a tag on their ankle, they go, I can't go. So, three very quick um, case studies. Um, Mr. A, that's not his real name, um, he was convicted uh, 12 years in prison for trying to burn down a publisher's. And he knows who I'm talking about. Um, he was somebody who had a very strong self view. He thought he was almost famous, he thought he was in a film. We used to always say when he walked down the street, he'd suddenly stop and turn and expect everybody to clap him and cheer. He really had this view of himself. And when he was convicted of this act, people in his community said they were proud of him. It was a good thing for him to do. So we knew when he came out, we couldn't let him go home, couldn't let him go back to that community. We had to break that cycle. And what we did with him, we introduced him to a mentor, uh, a guy who was a cage fighter. So the, the hook, or the way that the guy got involved with him, because this man wanted to go to the gym, wanted to get a bit healthy, wanted to look fit. So we introduced him to this guy who over a period of three, four, five years really got to grips with him and actually and then was going to the mosque with him, was praying with him, was helping him get work. And they still work today. And it was that that actually the two of them are very close ethnically, very close from the background, very close age. They both had young children, they had so much in common um, that, you know, they just developed this friendship. I, I used to say that um, he used to be called a mini-me. So the mentor had a very particular way of shaving a, a particular look. And as soon as the offender began to look like that and shave their beard in that way, I knew it had worked. So mentoring worked very well with him. Second one, Mr. B, again, not his real name. He went to ACF. He came out of there one night. He was quite a difficult person to get into. He'd said that he'd been very upset by prison. Um, you know, he'd been frightened. He'd been all these things, but actually hadn't been. He'd liked the status being a terrorist gave him. Uh, he came out of ACF one night, and he came across a car with um, four guys, I think two of them that he knew that were Asian Muslim guys, trying to drag a girl into the car. He knew this was the wrong thing to do, and he tried to help this girl. Another guy, I think a white Polish guy, came along and helped him, and they got this girl away. Now, what he, this critical incident for him suddenly said that these guys who he thought were good Muslims were the bad people, and this guy who he thought was a, a non-believer, kuffar, nothing, was the good person. And this opened really a sort of cognitive doorway for us, this sort of dissonance for him, opened up the fact that we could then capitalise on that. And because Hanif knew him and was working with him, although we didn't seem to think we were getting too far with him, suddenly we were able to capitalise on that. So sometimes it's about capitalising on things that are not in your control. And again, he's, um, I think, a scaffolder now, isn't he? Probably earning more than me and Hanif together. Um, scaffolding in London has just moved away from it. He has a couple of wobbles, maybe a couple of years back, but he's done very well. I still occasionally see him out and about. I know Hanif sees him quite often. Yeah. And finally, just to say, it's not always about what we do. Sometimes the threat of things is enough. So Mr. C, again, that's not, no, actually it might be his real name, I'm not sure. Um, he came out of prison and he, uh, he was a, a propagator. So he was quite a well-known face around London um, with uh, Al Mahajaroon group. He'd been in prison. He didn't like being in prison. He was very resistant to working with us, um, very resistant to change. He had a lot of status. LBC offered him a radio show um, when he came out, and he, he was going to take up that offer. So the status afforded to him made him, you know, difficult to work with. We could, you know, he didn't have any qualifications, so actually he's not going to go from working on LBC to, you know, stacking tins in Sainsbury's or whatever. Not that that's a bad job, but, you know, it's just about where he saw himself in life. So actually, because he didn't engage with us, we recalled him back to prison, sent him back to prison, uh, and then again, another six months, then brought him out again. And he said to us, I don't like prison. I want to see my family. I don't want to go back to prison. So I'll just what, tell me what I need to do. So he engaged with us. He wore a tag. We managed everything he did. 
And then when he went back with Al Mahajarun, I used to go and, along and see him and talk with him, and he knew how far he could go. Now, he may not be, uh, he's an extremist still, so he may not be the safest person, but he's not a violent extremist, he's not espousing violence, he's not getting people to go abroad. He just has a view that is, in my opinion, and, and the opinion of probably quite a few people in here, extreme. But should we lock him up because we don't agree with his views? I don't think so. He's changed, he's modified his behavior. So that would lead me perfectly onto a question. De-radicalization versus disengagement. Now certainly he, Mr. C there, moved from one behavior to another behavior. So he was a violent extremist to being an extremist. Is that shift enough? The fact that he's probably still radicalized, does that make him long-term dangerous or not? Is everybody on board? Is everybody really on board? Maybe is the thing to say. We work with the police, with the prison. Um, we all have differing agendas. It's quite difficult. We used to call ourselves critical friends. I don't think I was seen by many police officers as a friend. But we would criticize what each other did, but within our own agendas. And we would manage it. I think Hanif was there for a few fraught discussions, who we say. We used to call them uh, angry conversations sometimes. Um, but actually, you know, can we? Can we believe that we want to rehabilitate? Do the police really want to rehabilitate? Do the government really want to rehabilitate? Does everybody it part of this process? Um, how do we measure success? What is success? We have tools that measure engagement. We have tools that measure risk, or the, you know, the lowering, mitigating of risk. Um, but do we have anything? I know that of all the offenders that I've worked with, only one has been reconvicted of a terrorist offense. So that, to me, is a success. But actually, some of them have gone on to commit crime. They were petty criminals anyway. I'm interested in terrorism, not crime. So to me, that's still a success. Um, maybe if I was a victim of that crime, I'd think differently, but that's that. Um, and finally, what if it goes wrong? If it does go wrong, if we do have somebody who does something, are we gonna sit there and point the finger? You know, are we gonna be like the government? Am I gonna have to do an amber rudder? Am I gonna have to resign over it? Or are we gonna sit there and say, actually, you know what? These are human beings, we're human beings. We're trying to do the best we can. And even within that, sometimes it does go wrong. Okay, that's, I think, perfectly on time, really, Hannah. It is, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, we're going to go into a workshop um, where we're going to be uh, discussing and going into some examination of what's been said today. But the whole idea of this workshop is to examine what's been said today, and let's cross-examine that against case studies. Thank you very much. No applause.